You're listening to episode 256 of Mito Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, Adam Bergstrom returns to the show. First of many for the year 2024. In this episode, we talk about the current events of the world. He explains why most people garden wrong and why you want to garden using beach sand. He talks about why he likes distilled water and why he doesn't drink it by itself. Talks about copper overload, the benefits of cayenne pepper, why he believes the soil is not low in minerals, why measuring blood pH has nothing to do with the total pH of the body, the absorbable protein in tomatoes, why bodybuilders have used iceberg lettuce, I ask him whether he's still supplementing pregnenolone, DHEA, or thyroid. He shares why he isn't a fan of hair tissue mineral analysis, or HTMA. Then we get into some wild topics. We talk about EV, TOL, electric vehicle takeoff and landing vehicles, electric cars. He talks about the Hutchinson effect, why he supports technology that will get us to space, why he thinks genetics are a scam, why he believes it's easy to overload on minerals. I ask him about lithium, and he shares a quote from his mentor, Adon Olay, that said, lithium can cure and cause every disease in the world. I ask Adam his thoughts on fiber. He shares why he doesn't like melted cheese, popcorn, or psyllium husk his tips for constipation, why he is not a fan of the gallbladder flush. And then I ask him listener questions, including why focus on produce foods if we're trying to minimize mineral intake? Someone asks, collagen and coffee, is that okay to consume on an empty stomach? What are his thoughts on melatonin? What are his thoughts on tocotrienols, biofilms, protein to pair with rice? or with root vegetables, his thoughts on short-term fasting, how to heal from copper toxicity, importance of bioflow, seasonal affective disorders that actually exist, how to quickly heal the skin, especially on the hands, dietary suggestions for preconception, should coffee be avoided, what are some neutral foods that can be eaten any time of day in the context of his solar nutrition, What are Adam's thoughts on extraterrestrials and recent UAP stuff, unidentified aerial phenomenon? We cover so much ground in this show, as we always do with Adam. So enjoy the show. Here is Adam Bergstrom. All right, Adam Bergstrom, welcome back. Glad to be here. (laughs) I, I'm losing count. I think this is the 15th show we've done or something like that. So. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're uh, Mr. Boogie Woogie is your, your title here on Zoom. Mr. Boogie Woogie. <laughs> Professor Full Tilt, Bodacious Boogie Woogie, the ace of space, the dead ringer, hard singer, hum dinger, six foot one, a pull up on the Buddha, hoochie, coochie, man, the close gear, tight rap, rap et cetera. I forget. <laughs> I used to have that rap because one of my hobbies is slang dictionaries. I used to go to movies that had uh, jargon and be able to write slang in the dark while the movie was going on. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. That's impressive. Still. <laughs> well, well I, had, I, I had a technique of folding a piece of typewriter paper into eights. And then I could write a couple on one deal and then switch it over and write on the next section. So I wouldn't be writing over everything like that. So I devised these uh, because they don't like it when you shine a flashlight in the middle of a movie. <laughs> that has to be good for the brain, right? Like exercising different parts of the brain. You do that. Yeah, I, I also uh, switched hands at one point and wrote, oh. took notes with the other hand. And it's really interesting because uh, I did some drawing that way and it was like someone else's artwork. Wow. <laughs> Unrecognizable. Do yeah, you think it's, it's beneficial for people to like practice brushing their teeth with the opposite hand? Like if you're a right-handed, tr- brush your teeth with your left and do, do that frequently or? 
I th- I think so. I I was a contrarian. I was told that it damages the brain to switch hands, and so of course I had to switch hands. And uh, one time I worked at a metaphysical bookstore at the time, and and I wrote all the uh, the records, the, the sales by hand with the with my right hand instead of my left hand, and they thought I had brain damage. Until I told them what I was doing, they said, oh, we're relieved. We thought you had brain damage because I had really neat uh, printing. I didn't like to do cursive in school at all. I dropped out of a class because they insisted on cursive. And I went right to my counselor and said, let me out of that place. Wow. So, uh, But when I switched hands, of course, it looked like a, uh, a fourth grade a grader doing his hand uh, printing. <laughs> so why, why didn't you like cursive? Because I, I grew up. Uh, writing in cursive, mostly, I remember. You know, I, I was uh, obsessed with the comics as a kid. Mm. So okay. they printed. And so I would print my little cartoon strips, Zip Zordon and uh, Captain Nirvana and whatever it was. And they printed. So after that, I started turning in, printed the work probably maybe the fifth grade it started. But from then on, it was just printing. And most wow. of my teachers liked it. said, wow, your stuff is really easy to read, you know. <laughs> right. Interesting. Well, your, your background there is a lot sunnier and uh, greener than it is here. <laughs> I see <laughs> snow on all the trees outside. And uh, yeah, it's uh, different, uh, almost like summer over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I like it. We're we're kind of chilly because we don't have uh, heating in here. We actually have floor heating that got repaired, but we're afraid to turn it on because the rodents are eating the place up. <laughs> we we had a rodent guy finally come, and I think he's going to fix it. And we were told that if you feed a rodent uh, chewing gum, they will uh, choke on it and die. Well, we bought a barrel, I mean, a big bucket of double bubble, which is supposed to work. And we kept on throwing it and it kept disappearing and disappearing. And finally, they had a nest in the washing machine and they used it as part of their nesting material. Smart. That's so smart. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I have a lot of experience with the roads up here. They're they're Uh, interesting. (laughs) Sorry, you're saying so finally... (laughs) <laughs> well, uh, finally, we had some guy came out here and basically he said they, he found a vent they're getting in. And he said, so he set traps and he said, they're going to freak out, though, because they can't get out anymore to get their food. And so they're going to starve to death. And uh, anyway, be careful that they don't go into some other part of your house because we don't have them. We're in like a two story uh, cracker box here and downstairs is separate from the garage. And so we're really careful not to have any run in through that door. And so far we have none in this part of the house, only in the garage part. And, but boy, they have colonized the freaking garage. It sounds like you guys need to get a cat or two. <laughs> well, we've got the, the landlord has cats, but uh, oh. now they're getting the, the one is a male and doesn't like to hunt. The other one hunts once in a while, but it's getting lazy. Because before she loved to deliver one to the back door here, like I kill the cat. Uh, aren't I great? And you can yeah. have what's left after I'm finished. <laughs> yeah, it's their way of showing uh showing appreciation, I believe, right? Yeah. So, they really do. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, ours are proli- all three are prolific hunters. Well, I guess our youngest lava just likes to swat them around. Um, uh. but my my uh <laughs> Uh, Lyra, the the girl, she's like the boss. She's like the alpha of the pack. She shreds them. She'll she'll wow. grab, you know, decapitate, and that not to be super graphic, but she tears them <laughs> apart and like she gnaws on the skull and she loves it. <laughs> like, yeah, same here. The when when uh, Mirabelle used to hunt, uh, that's what she would do. But lately, she's getting lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I've dealt with pack rats in the shop, and supposedly they can eat through the wiring in your car and cause like thousands of dollars of damage. I've had them in my car for five years. And wow. I think after the Thomas fire and the Montecito debris flow, I think that's when they showed up because before that we went to New Zealand for three months, no problem, had no problem at all. And right after that, 
They started colonizing my car. They ate all the uh, insulation completely out. The wires seem intact. They're just interested in the insulation. Uh, insulation. So there's no insulation left now. And I think I've finally gotten rid of them, knock on wood, after, uh, after God, how many years? 2015 or something. Been ridiculous. Wow. wow. Yeah, there's all sorts of traps, you know, living here in Idaho. People told me, like, you can have a bucket and like a basically like a rod going across and like a beer can or aluminum can. And when they go across to the, I think you put peanut butter on it. And when they go to get it, they spin off the can and fall into the bucket and you could be nice and leave the bucket empty or you can fill it with water. So they drown. I've, I've never tried it, but I guess that's a common th thing that people do here in Idaho. Yeah, we've heard that. And we they get too smart for the mouse traps. They actually right. have a way of getting it out. But what the bug man told us is that you use an almond because oh. they can't they can't really get that out easily. And wow. they, they go for nuts. So almonds are one of the things he's using down there in wow. the four traps he set for us. So Interesting. Wow. And then, yeah, if they eat it, if they do get it, though, they'll probably turn it into like super rodents because aren't almonds really good for, it, for the pineal gland and everything? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really think they're getting smarter, you know, to be able to get things out of traps because we put some things in there that uh, I'm really surprised they were able to nibble it out and pull it out without spraying the traps. They We got them once and then they got smart right after that. Wow. Well, I know in the past we, we've talked about and you, you brought up how events that happen in your life that seem to be just random are always or usually, correct me if I'm wrong, related to uh, like something going on inside of you internally, like emotionally or mentally. I know you were dealing with like fridge stuff and now that mice, have you delved into like what all of it means basically? Or you know, Swami Nitty Gritty went into that in detail. He said that we often use our belongings as shunts. So rather than get a broken bone, it was better to break a cup or even wreck a car and not get hurt because it's better to have a, a broken car than a broken bone because you can always, as he said, have the money to get a new car. But getting a new bone is another problem or having to, or losing a leg or something like that. So I've seen examples of that, that uh, uh, someone even wrote a book about it. Like if you have a radiator problems with your car, you, you, you have a temper problem and blah, 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 for all different things like that. So uh, I really have seen so many examples of that. I believe it. <laughs> yeah, it probably takes some, some time to kind of delve into that and figure out what it is, right? Like the it does. And one thing with mind hacking is you can go and actually find out what the uh, what that is. The cornerstone technique where you just turn a person's feet. Strangely enough, it only shows trauma like you can't find anything like if a person's ecstatic about something, it won't show. But the trauma will show. And that was probably my only original discovery where I discovered that accidentally working on a tennis player buddy of mine where I was turning his feet and uh, he mentioned a woman's name and his right foot jumped. And I thought, could it be this easy? And so I asked him, what did you say? He repeated it and his right foot jumped again. Women's a woman trauma shows up on the right foot and a male on the left foot, contrary to American psychology and polarity therapy. But there it is. Wow. Well, uh, well before we started recording, we were talking about uh, controversial <laughs> topics. And now everything's controversial, right? Both uh, socially and just with all the, the watchers that we have on all the social media networks and all the, the censorship and flagging and uh, censoring and all that. It's just, um, but it, it seems like we're kind of out of the craziness of the masking and all the stuff that's been going on. But every once in a while I'll hear like up in Canada, they're talking about bringing it back and um, the, the shutdowns and the, you know, locking people in their houses. Uh, are you hearing that that's going to come back or 
You've been they're going to try. They're having trouble giving some of the booster shots and things like that. Now people aren't buying it. And even now on ESPN, the sporting things, someone came out against Jimmy Kimmel and all of his. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And about uh, about the things. Even Fauci has now admitted that the six foot rule was not scientifically based. It just kind of showed up. <laughs> And of course, he kept, you know, wear two masks, wear no masks, wear this mask. It, mm-hmm. it went on and on. So the the thing is, I would like to see people punished for this because mm-hmm. what we went through for the last four years is uh, totally unjustified. You know, I, I won't go into the exact details. We, we all know what that is. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, this pandemic put people out of business. Uh, it it ba- gave all the money to Bezos and Walmart and businesses like that. And the mom and pop businesses weren't considered essential, only the big guys, which is really silly. And then you had rules like uh, you, you could walk into the restaurant, you needed a mask, but if you sat down and ate, then you were safe. But as soon as you went to the bathroom, you were not safe again. And here in here in uh, Carpinteria and uh, Santa Barbara, they actually had a snitch line to the police and they had a different line for Saturdays. And they even arrested a guy who was out on his paddleboard by himself a half a mile out in the sea. And they arrested him for being out and about when he shouldn't have been. You know, so it got absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> That's interesting. The point you made about mom and pop shops weren't weren't deemed essential. Because that that was the there were so many aspects of this right like separating families which I've seen a ton just separating humanity in general I mean online fighting just amplified I've seen over the last four years people are angry uh, just just angry to, they don't they don't know who to be angry at so they're just angry at everybody and always arguing always looking to pick a fight um, yeah I I wonder how much of that is liver stuff like I just got back into coffee enemas uh some guests some guests i've had on and talking about copper toxicity and copper overload and i didn't know 50 percent. i found the study 50 percent of copper is excreted in bile did you know that or that's yeah yeah i i, I did know that. <laughs> that, that that's why your gallbladder is very important and the liver because you can excrete it with your liver alone for people who have lost their uh, gallbladder and you still have a gallbladder meridian so there's oh, functions of the gallbladder still operative. But yeah, copper comes out that way. And uh, even though it's an essential element and you can actually overload to a certain amount on copper. But when you get to a degree like here in Montecito, they had a big scandal where people's pets were dying because the electricity grounded was actually taking the copper out of the pipes and this guy spent about $20,000 on his dog and finally realized it was copper. And an entire apartment building in downtown Santa Barbara, everybody was poisoned and suing the city for copper overload. So you can overload on it and uh, taking large amounts of copper, especially is not smart. Uh, copper rich foods, no real problem because, uh, you know, you get it out of like uh, shrimp and scallop and things like that. But uh, when you start loading it up, then the body just has so much ability to uh, handle it. Yeah, that's interesting. So the electricity released copper from the pipes. So the current running through, it makes sense because it's a conductive mineral. Like we're going we're to run, I'm getting a 30 kW generator, hopefully in the next several months. <laughs> and we're, they need to run a, a bigger wire uh, to the house because it's a bigger load than my current 15 kilowatt generator. And so they're going to use copper because I guess it's the the best conductor for running generator power to houses. Yeah. But that's the safest trick. way is to have a filter and uh, we use distilled water. You know, yeah. it, we don't need the minerals. We get it out of food. So we take our distilled water, make our coffee, make our juices, mm-hmm. make our soups and stews uh, is how we use it. We don't drink distilled water. Even as uh, back in the 1960s, I used to say, uh, I don't drink water because it rusts pipes and puts gills on fishes. But <laughs> do, do you have a theory on what I remember? This was like seven years ago or something. You know, as you know, I'm always experimenting. And I was at my buddy's house in La Jolla, actually. And they had a 
a whole house distiller and I was having a sneeze attack because I'm just I'm prone to allergies and sneezing. And I drank a glass of distilled water. It must have been eight ounces just down the hatch. And it stopped my sneeze attack instantly. And I still wonder, was it dissolving mucus or what was it doing? But- you know, it's interesting. There's a rule I learned from my buddy Steve Shiver. Uh, anything can cause anything and anything can cure anything. So it's really surprising. And I don't know any scientific reason for that, but it could. And perhaps the the minerals were put aside while you do it. See, a lot of people are afraid of distilled water because it's going to take all the minerals out of your body, which is ridiculous when you think of how much of your body is. It, it could do it in your mouth, but I don't think your mouth is going to be a problem. But actually, yeah. uh, something like that could act like a medicine and could have actually stopped uh, an asthma attack or an allergy attack. Hmm. Yeah, your stuff on minerals is so interesting. And uh, later on, I have some uh, questions that listeners sent in related to that because you have a, a much, it's it's like an opposite uh, perspective on minerals that a lot of people, like right, right now it's trending to remineralize your water like heavily, like Dave Asprey's talking about it. He's like sea salt in your water first thing in the morning hydrates you better. Uh, I drink plain water first thing upon waking. I don't put minerals in it. Um, I, I I probably have an in between perspective between you and the remineralization people, <laughs> like somewhere in the middle of that, but probably closer to your approach. Uh, it's interesting that that that's being pushed so hard is adding sea salt to your water. And I used to do the sole salt, so it dissolves salt. And then it is so much work, right? I don't know if it's worth it. Uh, we use plain salt on a regular basis. I have it in the morning on my avocado. Yeah, I have a pinch of cayenne to kind of as an activator to activate that. <laughs> cayenne, according to Solar Nutrition, has a time. It's mostly midday, unless you take African bird pepper, which grows on a tree and used to be one of the hottest you could get. But uh, a little bit of that has really no time because it's a precipitator. It makes things digest better or absorb. Uh, In fact, if you have something that's not sweet enough, you can put a tiny bit of cayenne in there and it brings out the sweetening effect of it. Wow. Uh, We used to have a friend that would make all these uh, really rock hard uh, type of what would you uh, like donuts or whatever but health food versions and he would make them so hard and so unsweetened that we would add a pinch of cayenne so that we could dissolve it easier wow. and you would get the sweetness effect <laughs> wow interesting it, it it's funny thinking back i think it was like three shows ago um i don't know if you remember but i had a little bottle of copper on my counter and during i think it was two hours into our three-hour interview I took a <laughs> a squirt in my hand and I just rubbed it in. I think he even put some in, in my coffee during our show. It, it made me feel, I was like slightly nauseous, but definitely energetic and like a slight euphoria. Uh, minerals are pretty powerful. They're kind of like drugs, right? They really are. A lot of people don't realize that. Now, here's here's a common misconception. People think that the soil is low on minerals every time you do it. But what soil is, is nothing but silica. It's nothing but silica. Because what they want to do is tell you that you need uh, compost, which is usually recycled forest products, right? But plants don't grow that way. They have a, uh, they have a layer on top, like mulch. And then the forest grows fine with that layer. And the roots require nothing but pure silica quartz or clay if you want to retain water more and no minerals down there at all the minerals are on the top and seep in all you need to be a, an organic gardener is put some leaves on top of your plants and you will get you will get fine uh, problems the the plants recycle themselves a tree will drop its leaves down and then eat its leaves and keep going so the minerals stay in the soil it's a misconception that we're losing all the minerals out of the soil 
Because mm. they don't just evaporate out. They're in the d- decaying leaves. And yeah, they, they come in, and, they, right? the plant recycles them perpetually. It's almost like a, re- a, a <laughs> recycling machine. Uh, there is a, a man called Gary Matsuoka, who's one of the few people. And they keep arguing with him in all the other nurseries that you need recycled organic yeah. matter. And he said, all you need is quartz. The best thing to grow your plants on is beach sand. If you're near the beach and you don't have salt in that soil, Mm. then sand is the perfect one. Why gardeners don't usually do it, though, it weighs like 100 pounds for a sack where normally the other ones are so light you can pick it up with 20 pounds or whatever. (laughs) Wow. Why? I don't know if you've seen my posts, but we've been experimenting with the the geodesic dome greenhouse here in the snow and it looks like an igloo looking out my window right now. Like there's snow packing up the walls. Uh, like the, even the first layer is kind of up. But yeah, we bought a mixture of compost without manure and just organic topsoil. They say peat free. Um, it's supposed to be more envi- environmentally friendly and stuff. But uh, we'll be experimenting. I, I mean, I think uh, it's so wet up here. I mean, Pacific Northwest, there's water everywhere. So our issue is too much water, like the humidity in there. I've been trying to bring down from a hundred percent. We just got our pellet stove live, like an off grid, the zigzagging pellet stove that feeds pellets through gravity into this chamber. And then it burns at like 600, 700 degrees. And that's been pulling a lot of moisture out, but the beds are still so soggy that I wonder the best material to use that would just drain. I think there's like a little spring actually under where we built the, the greenhouse so if you can get beach sand it's actually the best but it's probably <laughs> impractical to pick, put hundreds of pounds of it up there because see the uh the size of sand are in big pellets where they like imagine them as the size of a, of a bowling ball and so you have all the space between them and the water just sinks down as you get silt you get a mixture of smaller pellets and then it's it retains water. When you get oh. clay, it's like confetti compared to bowling balls, so it obviously retains the water. But people think that the that you can overwater your plants, and unless you use organic fertilizer, you can't overwater a plant. Uh, unless now, say you have a pool and flood it with water and leave it in for three weeks, then the oxygen is taken out of the water because that's what you're watering the plants for, for the oxygen, and then it it uh, it dies. That's why in reservoirs, they give you oxygenated water at a certain percentage, because if you water your plants with no oxygen in the water, you kill them. <laughs> they <Wow>. can't breathe. <laughs> I wonder if carnivorous plants, like that's one of my, my obsessions is carnivorous plants, and I actually want to build a bog up here in the summer. They love standing water, like uh, Venus flytraps, like I have books on them, the Savage Gardens, my favorite, and they like a, a dish under the pots. If you're growing like pitcher plants or Nepenthes or uh, uh, Sarsenia or whatever, like whether pitcher or Venus fly traps or sundews, they all they tend to like just sitting in water. But I wonder if that's because they have a different way to get nitrogen, which is insects. Uh, it could be, it could be. Yeah, they, a lot of plants do grow in standing water, and they have no problem with it. Obviously, <laughs> other ones that require or or they say they need uh, organic compost are things like uh, avocado trees, which are known mm. to be overwatered. But again, if you use sand or the correct soil, you won't have any problem, even with uh, even with avocados and and uh, what is it, roses and uh, lavender, things like that, or or supposedly, oh, you can overwater it. But no one ever overwatered back in the days. There was no problem with it. And still they started saying it was natural to grind up trees into little parts. Now, if you put that in your swimming pool, you'll have sewage. And that's what the plants are confronted with. If you put a piece of log in your swimming pool, it might take a thousand years to de- decompose. That's how nature works. The the no tree falls down and fractures into sawdust automatically to feed yeah. the plants. It's really ridiculous. T- 
peat, by the way, is so far gone, it's not going to decompose anymore. Mm. So peat is a good choice. And volcanic ash in Hawaii is ideal <laughs> because it, uh, it's, it's made out of a certain percentage of charcoal, which is good mm. to grow plants in. So if I have, uh, like we have buckets of wood ash, because during the winter, it's just every day burning the wood stove. Do you think adding that to the soil is great? Because I think that that's mainly to alter the pH. People use that. Yeah, the uh, the pH is important. It, it, certain plants go uh, grow more in an acid form, and certain in an alkaline form, and that's very important. It's also important for the human body, but people want to compare it to the blood, and the blood has almost nothing to do with pH of the total body, almost nothing. But it's commonly assumed that you can measure the saliva, the urine, but that's what's coming out of your body, not what's in your body. Total pH actually takes seven measurements to really get it scientifically. And uh, and if you go to a disease like a tumor or an ulcer, you need a pH meter because the disease happens in an unbuffered area. And uh, that... Uh, that uh, otherwise it's buffered. Your blood is buffered. So how can you measure pH from that? Unless you're having total breakdown in the body, then you will die from being over alkaline or over acid when it reaches the blood, but it almost mm. never reaches the blood. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think uh, there's, there's many like buffering systems in the body, right? Like the bicarbonate buffering system, I think even protein itself buffers the pH. And there's a relationship with bicarbonate and CO2, right? So, like, that's why a lot of people get into the breathing exercises. Yeah, and also it's like, say you cook a, uh, a piece of meat in, in a pot. How can you measure the pH by measuring the water? And it's right. cooking in. It's what's coming <laughs> out of it. You can't measure the dry matter, which is protein and fat. There's almost no water in fat. It's uh, it's basically air is sucking into the fat. So you can't really measure total body pH without seven measurements, including the surface tension of the water, the uh, – uh, the, uh, anyway, it takes seven, seven measurements to, mm. uh, to do correctly. Mm. Interesting. Well, I'll have to experiment with some of your, uh, your, your gardening tips. Have you, have you done any of this at home? Like the things that you've researched or. We haven't been able to get the proper soils, but we, we're kind of Mickey Mouse in it. And we're in a position where we really can't grow an extensive garden here. We're on that. We have landlords that uh, yeah. let's say we're restricted. They're really yeah. nice people. They have gardens and they share their food with us sometimes. So yeah. that's nice. I, I've, I've been there. My The last cabin, or one of the last cabins I was renting, I got two goats and it was like, it was like the size of my upstairs here. I just snuck them in and poor goats. I mean, they have like a little runway and then a little backyard box, but they were so loud. And then I tried chickens and I quickly learned to keep animals without your landlord knowing is really difficult. It is. <laughs> Especially farm the, animals. <laughs> by the way, if you want to check out uh, YouTube every Saturday, Gary Matsuoka does a show on YouTube. <laughs> that is released uh, on Saturday and get one of his uh, soil shows. You'll mm -hmm. find it really fascinating. Yeah. He knows his stuff and he goes against all these academics who, and they say, you don't have a PhD. How can you know anything about yeah. this? <laughs> and he is said, the PhDs have started all this stuff <laughs> about organic fertilizer before his dad would water, and never over water. And suddenly when they started following the advice of the various types of, uh, of organic fertilizers, their food, their, their stuff was rotting. And wow. so his father asked him, can you figure this out? And that's what it turned out to be that the, uh, that the fertile, the organic fertilizer was actually causing the problem. Wow. How do you spell Matt, his last name? Gary Matsuoka M A T. S U O O K A. Okay, found it. Yeah, Gary's best gardening. 
That's the yeah. guy. Yeah. Every okay. Saturday he gives a show. Get one of his ones on. He does ones on tomatoes, on roses, on everything too. But the soil one is the most interesting. And he does bring up soil just about every show anyway. But the ones on soil are the most fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. I just wonder, because there's no sand up here in North Idaho. I mean, I guess maybe near the lakes, but I know my property has mostly clay. Uh, in the ground. So yeah, I and wonder clay if, it retains yeah. water more, but d- just as long as you're not using organic fertilizer, except on top, you know, you right. do need mulch because it obviously does need some minerals, mm-hmm. but the roots don't need minerals. Mm-hmm. They need oxygen to breathe is all they need. And then mm-hmm. the rest of the, uh, whatever they need, they bring from the top soil down or the mulch level. But when people mm-hmm. grow it in fertilizer, some plants like tomatoes don't care. They'll mm-hmm. grow in compost. You can right. put them in a compost pile. And there are some plants that will do that. Most of them will die if you grow it in pure compost. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because there's this guy, uh, you know, I come from like the raw vegan like lineage. <laughs> I mean, I was into it for a uh, hardcore for like three, four years. And um, John Kohler, I think I actually saw him at a trade show once. He has like a million subscribers or something on this gardening YouTube channel. And I've heard him say several times you can grow any plant in straight compost and they'll love it. But you're, you're saying yeah, only certain that's not plants. True, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> in, in fact, that's one of the arguments that you need. Uh, they, they will grow tomatoes and say, see, it works. Yeah. But tomatoes try lavender or try some other yeah. avocado and see what happens. They wow. deliberately have to uh, have to, uh, with avocados, they often the tree roots will come into the plants, so the, into the uh, avocado orchards. So the growers will actually cut off and put a barrier between that, so that it doesn't get all that extra mineralization and kill the plants, the trees. Wow! Wow! You know, yeah. a farmer a farmer uses one percent fertilizer, one percent. And what do other people use? Like 50% in nurseries and things like that. But a farmer would kill all those plants, but they know it. The farmers know it, but the uh, the nurseries don't know it. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a koi pond we have. It's like roughly 3,600 gallons. we got 10 koi fish swimming around wow. in there. And I have on the way, it's like a, a electricity-free, well, besides the UV light, which is optional to run, it'll siphon the water down into these two chambers and the last chamber it'll mix the fish poop with like like 10 percent fish poop and then 90 percent water and then the idea is you can run that through the beds do you think that's a good idea if it's just 10 percent of the fish poop in there uh it should be on top as long as it, mm. because when the roots get it, that's where the problem is. The roots okay. need oxygen. Yeah, but watering on top. On top. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then they'll, the, the rest of the plant will get those minerals right out of the mulch. Same oh. in the forest. When when trees fall over and when leaves fall down, they just use it on top. The leaves don't go under the ground yeah. for the roots to grow. Makes sense. And that's the big mistake. And and Gary Matsuoka makes it clearer than I'm doing here because he's he's been dealing with it for like 30 years now or so, where wow. he's been opposing uh, every other nursery in the country practically is like that. Now, they don't notice it. Like if you get a plant back east for a garden, uh, you won't notice it because the, uh, the season ends and the plant's not going to die over watering. But in places like California, where you get a second season, the plants die. And then they always say, the nursery said, well, you overwatered. Well, that's not true. You you cannot overwater a plant unless it's in standing water and it's a dry plant that's not supposed to be like a a blueberry is basically a cranberry that crawled out of the water. So if it stands in a puddle or, you know, three inches deep of water, it's going to run out of oxygen. Yeah. The cranberry won't because it's used to getting its oxygen out of moving water. Interesting. Yeah, we have a goji plant in there. And actually, uh, when I moved, I gave my old ones to my neighbor. And he's like, these grow, these are like weeds. And the one in my dome, it's growing new leaves. And we're getting like two, three hours of light a day on average here the last month. I mean, it's been so gloomy, like cloudy every day. And that goji plant's still producing fresh shoots. It's wow. crazy. 
Goji's a good plant. A lot of people don't realize it's deadly nightshade. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah, for people who avoid those, they forget about that one. But yeah, it's it's in the cayenne family and the and the uh, the other nightshade families, tomatoes and potatoes and all of that. It was promoted really heavily. It was promoted as like a superfood, right? In the like the vegan community. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it, I wouldn't call it a superfood, but it's a good food, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for it, the lungs. Is it true? Like when I was looking into it years ago, I read somewhere that they weren't traditionally eaten straight. They were more brewed into a tea to get the maximum benefits. Any thoughts on that? Or? They they have done that before. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And and they've been dried ones and they make drinks, you know, Young Living Oil makes a, a goji <laughs> drink, which they have changed the formula. I used to really like it, but haven't liked the latest formula, but maybe they're doing another one now. Yeah, I tried the latest one. Yeah, it was kind of like chemically. I don't know how to describe it. I just didn't something tasted off with it. Yeah, I I like the original taste. So I I don't know yeah. if they've ruined its effect or whatever, but I just yeah. like the original taste. Yeah. So same with citrus. Like we have, uh, not to make this entire show in gardening. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> so we have like lemon, orange, lime in there, and I think only one of them's not doing well. But the citrus loves sand as well. Same thing. Same say. thing. Yeah. Wow. They they love sand. Wow. And people wow. always put the fertilizer, then they have to worry about overwatering. Uh, I'm not sure where citrus stands as far as uh, how much water it can take. Some plants mm -hmm. are very intolerable of, uh, of the compost, and other ones, like tomatoes, will thrive in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, that's where I started with tomatoes. I mean, I feel like tomato and lettuce... Like or like anybody, like a child can grow it. Anybody can grow it, right? <laughs> they grow just about anywhere, and they're they're really a superfood. Uh, they did a study showing that you get free form amino acids out of tomatoes and get more than any other food. No one ever measured for free form amino acids. They only measured for protein. And finally, yeah. someone at the Heritage. Uh, uh, seed company measured for that and was shocked to find out that you can get free form amino acids. The ones I used to sell injectable grade uh, aminos for like $40 a bottle for a small bottle of a hundred uh, to bodybuilders when I was in Portland and didn't realize that you can get them for free out of tomatoes. <laughs> And you, you've said the beefsteak tomato is the highest, right? That that was what the guy at the Heritage uh, Seed Company found out. I'm going to see if I can find the, the title of that book. I've got it somewhere in my files. Yeah, that's fascinating. Wow. the beef, And, and I think you've said like lettuce, because I think especially the carnivore people, that's really still trending right now, like lectins, phytates, and oxalates, and, you know, lettuce is horrible for you. You said iceberg lettuce is uh, medicinal, right? Like for uh, bodybuilding even? Well, it has something like opioids in it, so it can relax you. I actually, I was first told that by Don Olay, uh, my major me mentor at first on health. And uh, later I went to El Paso and I was telling people that you can get addicted to, uh, to uh, iceberg lettuce. And he said, it's true. I'm an example. In Juarez, Mexico, where I was raised, poor mothers who couldn't, uh, didn't have milk for their babies would give them iceberg lettuce and to put them asleep so they wouldn't be crying all night. And he said since then, he would get up in the middle of the night and eat a head of lettuce all by itself with nothing else every night practically. So Wow. <laughs> Wait, so is that a is that one cure for insomnia potentially? It could be. Yeah, I wow. I used to do it. In fact, I'd have uh I'd make some iceberg lettuce juice when I was uh going through some kind of traumatic events or whatever was going on and it wow. would relax me, like cool me out. I wow. had a friend that could eat eat a head at a time too. I I don't know what her history was with iceberg letters. I could only eat uh, God the amount you would put on a hamburger or something like that is all I could do. You know? <laughs> I like lettuce, but I the amount she was eating were just amazing. She was a vegan. Yeah. Okay, well I think it was like 
two weeks ago or so or a week ago, I had a, a random bout of insomnia and I never get it to where I just felt like wired and entered like I almost like it was a full moon and I might as well just stay up. And so I, I was up at like 3 a.m. on my laptop just researching because I couldn't sleep. So I'm like, I'm just not going to lie here. I know in the, like the Ray Pete community, they recommend like honey uh, or milk. I think Ray Pete used to recommend, you know, glass of milk before bed and um, or ice cream. What are some of your favorite things for insomnia if someone has that? Uh, sugar will help. Just plain mm -hmm. sugar. Yeah, that's all you need. But you can have honey or you know, whatever like that. Anything going into the stomach actually makes you sleepy. That's why when I was at a soupy camp where we were basically doing almost controlled fasting, uh, you stay awake all the time. You can't go to sleep. So we'd be up all night, get a couple hours of sleep, and then be exercising again. I lost wow. about 30 pounds doing that, wow. by the way, in, in six weeks. Uh, I was down to skin and bones. There's a picture of me. Look, when, when people see that photograph, I should put it out on, uh, on social media. They say it looks like someone threw uh, some ribs on the side of the road because all of my ribs were totally visible. I, got, I was down to, uh, let's see, normally when I was about 150 pounds, I was down to 128 pounds, I believe. Wow. So, wow. And that's at six foot two. Because <laughs> I've heard you build muscle while you sleep. So did, do you think you lost muscle or you gained muscle or what was that? Yeah, I lost some muscle mass. It's not, not a good idea. Fasting... <laughs> uh, has some benefits. Some people have actually been cured by it, but it mostly causes problems later on down the line. You do lose muscle. Now, they say you can't build it back. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe you can, but it's not as easy as building fat back or building uh, yeah. other parts of your body back. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the protein messaging, people recommending like 200, 300, 400 grams of protein a day and and heavy weightlifting uh throughout the week is that it gets harder to gain muscle like after your 50s so it's easier they're like recommend building up as much as you can and then maintaining it do you agree with that philosophy or definitely definitely maintaining it, it's important because it's hard to get it back after it starts to uh go away and you have to be very careful too many bodybuilders are actually what they call a muscle especially in bodybuilding, is fat. So if they don't exercise, they suddenly droop out. And I used to uh, hang out with a lot of the bodybuilding community. My friend Don Peters was uh, even a, uh, a contestant for Mr. Olympia and all of those. And I met some of these people when they were off season and holy cow they don't look like they look in the like they look in the bodybuilding books you know? well you look at like arnold schwarzenegger now or there's, there's like flab right like a lot of flabbiness that comes later a lot of flab when he doesn't work out he still works out pretty good i i'm, I'm not a fan of arnold very, <laughs> he's I turned into like a full socialist right <laughs> yeah, he's he's uh, he's uh, way out there. So many reasons. Also, he played a very dirty trick on my friend Don Peters. It was a bodybuilder. He he seduced his wife and uh, and and then in the morning he dialed up Don's number. Oh, right. I and remember said, that. And then yeah, then handed the phone to her and said, "It's for you." <laughs> And then he yelled, I effed your wife, screamed out on the phone. That's so. So Don, before that, they were friends. But after that, that was it for Don. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> Schwarzenegger was known for his dirty tricks. He, he was a practical joker, but some of them were really cruel. Yeah. Wow. As a bodybuilder, I admire him. He, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he did a lot of good things for bodybuilding. I'll give him that much. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with, uh, like, I know Dave Asprey is very outspoken about TRT, like testosterone replacement therapy. And he's like, I think uh, you're basically you're stupid if you're a man over 50 and not on TRT. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think you need that. I think you yeah. can make t- you can make your own testosterone if you eat uh, healthy foods, including mm-hmm. the vegetables that make free form amino acids and the protein. No, you can make uh, you could eating a wholesome diet. You can do that. Look at Fajal Singh. I believe he's still alive at 112, and he started running 25 mile marathons when he was in his 80s because he was in trauma over his son dying and so he opened at 100 years old or so he opened the 2000 olympics by running around the volume and and, and until about 2015 no no let's see 2010 or so he was running 25 miles a day and this guy never took a pill in his entire life of any kind or supplement or anything like that and was basically a uh uh, a vegetarian eating a little bit of milk here and rice and uh, beans and things like that. And look at the guy. <laughs> He's still alive, according to Wikipedia, unless they're behind in what happened. That's incredible. 25. Wow. Sp- speaking of pills, how did your experiment with, uh, was it uh, DHEA and pregnenolone? Did you, did you add that or how did, what was the result or? Yeah, we we had some serious problems going on. I won't go into, but uh, but we used a little bit of that. According to Ray P, we got a thyroid, we got progesty, which we still use, by the way, every day. And uh, we stopped using the DHEA. And one of the other problems. What was it? Uh, Pregnenolone. Pregnenolone. Mm -hmm. We found out that that has something else added into it. So I have Uh a couple bottles of that. And uh, I'm not sure if it helped or not. If we have some serious problems again, then we'll resort to them. But we had, uh, uh, let's just say we're lucky to be alive after last year. We had some really serious problems going on. Wow. So you think that progesterone is like safer than those that's been your experience with it the, the progesterone really is, was recommended by ray p mm-hmm. and we find it actually helps uh uh and so we it's one thing we take as on a regular basis uh, i don't usually <laughs> take a lot of supplements but that's yeah. one we take every day to this i day. think it tastes pretty good I, I i think i lost my bottle but i thought it actually tasted kind of like candy <laughs> yeah it's not that bad it's a it's little uh yeah, I like it. I, I didn't like it at first, but I got yeah. to like it. So we take it. We, we take a small amount and we take a larger amount if we have problems. And uh, yeah. we have some thyroid supplement, T3, and mm-hmm. uh, one that's a combination of three T3 mm-hmm. and T4. People who take Centroid or might have troubles with that because you can mm-hmm. actually go into a coma if your body can't convert the T4 to T3. So oh, wow. uh, people on thyroid have to be careful when they take Centroid and those type of drugs. Wow. Not, not to get too far in, into the weeds, but um, next month I have a show lined up with a guy. I think he's out of Canada or Europe. And I interviewed him. He created this basically a device where you can imprint frequencies in water, like, like basically like do it yourself homeopathy where you're putting the information of any substance into a liquid and it could be any liquid that's not hot. So you could even do it to your beer or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, on a show, I was listening to an interview with him, Anton, he's like a scientist and he was saying someone lowered their thyroid medication just with the frequency of T3. And he was very careful legally to not, Mm-hmm. you know, suggest anything, but supposedly they got off their med- thyroid meds and just were getting the energy of it from like water, <laughs> drinking like the, the information of T3 and water. I thought it was fascinating. I might, I might try it to see how I feel. Water does have information, but it's not the hydrogen. It's not the oxygen. Mm-hmm. It's the carbon dioxide in it. Okay. Yeah. He was talking about coherent domains and uh, I, I can't remember the scientist that he was referencing with the the idea, I mean, he's basically beaming EMFs. I mean, if you unplug your phone, you hear the the static, but it's converting the audio into EMFs. And then you're putting basically EMFs into the water and supposedly it's storing in, yeah, in the coherent domains of the H2O. But <laughs> Yeah, they think it's in the H2O, but it's actually in the carbon dioxide, which is, oh, which like if you have a neutral water, distilled water, 
and you leave it sitting in exposed air, it will be very acid very quickly because the carbon dioxide from the air will be absorbed into the water. Mm -hmm. And that's where the programming is. Think of it. You can't write with a hydrogen pencil. You can't write with an oxygen pencil, but you can write with a carbon pencil. (laughs) A so-called lead pencil is carbon and you write with it. And that's the same thing. All of our programming, what we call intellect and intelligence is actually done with carbon. And it can also be done with silicone, but not quite as well. That's why they're trying to get a carbon computer which is going to be superior to silicone computers they know it but so far they haven't worked out the details well this is kind of an interesting full circle connection to minerals because that kind of encompasses your philosophy on minerals in general because these other people they're saying it's like he said you can't do it to distilled water because it won't hold the information and they've tested it supposedly where you're saying the exact opposite (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exact opposite. water with less minerals holds so maybe that's like the bottom line yeah that belief that 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 underlies people's philosophy on minerals whether it's minerals that hold information or like you said it's carbon dioxide that actually holds the information yeah and actually both uh sri what was his name uh chandra bose uh jagadish chandra bose he actually found out that minerals have consciousness so but they work with the carbon dioxide and actually one of the most uh conscious minerals is tin more than (laughs) more than zinc and platinum is there too and tin is a very unusual mineral because it can change dramatically in structure with coal that's why napoleon executed his tailor who made the uniforms to go into russia because all the tin and the coal dissolved just broke apart and also a a crew in the arctic died because they put their water in tin containers and the tin just and the coal just dissolved oh wow Tin is very conscious, and uh, it's not only the plants, but see, where Bose got in trouble, he went to England and said that you don't need neurology for consciousness. All you need is oxygen is consciousness, carbon is uh, intellect, and hydrogen is desire, and nitrogen is will. Will Will power is a combination of hydrogen, uh, nitrogen using uh, hydrogen. So these elements actually have, uh, you don't need minerals, but they can change the direction of the thoughts. Wow. And carbon is intellect, you said? Yes. Carbon is Is definitely intellect and and intelligence where you can put things together and reason. Because just like you can't write without carbon, your brain won't think without carbon. Mind, I believe, like, Rupert Sheldrake is outside of the body, but mm. our receiver station, the radio, is our brain. Mm. Problems from there, either either from uh, yellow fat disease or from uh, uh, many breaks. People start mm. to have uh, little things. I notice in my 80s now, sometimes I forget certain words and I use uh, Vibrant Gal as my backup. You know, if I can't remember a word or something that just disappears and then comes back later. Yeah. So those things happen because the receiving station starts to break down after a while, unfortunately. Interesting. Well, I, I don't know. And I'm not tooting my own horn here, but ever, ever since I remember like college, I think once I started drinking raw goat milk and get my brain working again, I, uh, I, every book I would read, I was, I would find at least one, usually five typos, every single book. <laughs> and, uh, and every interview I listen to now, I notice high level PhDs, they'll switch words like in an interview, like they'll answer something. And it's almost every interview now I'll notice the guests do it is where the, a word is substituted where another word should be and it doesn't fit. And I wonder if that's the same thing you were talking about, because I just notice it now like more. <laughs> uh, that could happen. Now, some people like Ray Pete was amazing. You could you could transcribe what he said directly. Yeah. Elon Musk, forget about it. You know, he he admits that he has uh, uh, PS. He has shell shock, basically, and he also is uh, as many people in Silicon Valley are Asbury 
Asperger right. syndrome. So if you hear him talking and you try to uh, look at uh, a transcript of his writing, holy cow. <laughs> 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 but Ray Pete and other people, Noam Chomsky, all you have to books were written by Chomsky by just uh, talking to Alexander Cockburn. And then all I had to do is just do the transcript and get, mm-hmm. make almost no changes. Right. So some people are amazing that way. With me, yeah. you need changes. <laughs> <laughs> I write a lot differently than I talk. <laughs> I love it. Well, I, yeah, I think in one of your uh one of your comments on Facebook, you were saying your your fingers can't keep up or something. It was some comment like that the last couple of days. <laughs> well, sometimes I, I wake up in the middle of the night and my brain is rushing so fast, my hands can't keep up to write the thoughts <laughs> down. And uh, so maybe a tape recorder would be the answer to that. <laughs> sometimes I'll go in a speech and Vibrant Cow says, geez, we should have taped that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, I have a yellow mug since it's Wednesday. So, All right. <laughs> for those that aren't aware, go back and listen to our show on color therapy. Adam was saying, uh, was it Roy G. Biv with Monday through Sunday? Basically, there you but go. it's but it's black and white Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> right? Or purple? Yeah. yeah. We we go through a uh, a stratum of uh, consciousness that starts with the father at black, goes to the mother at gray, goes to brown, which is conception. And then you have Roy G. Bibb after that with your red and your orange and your yellow and your green and your blue and your indigo and your violet. And then strangely, it makes a jump right back to red again. So how did that happen yeah. that you made a, uh, a quantum leap from violet to red suddenly in the middle of the night? And those, right. those the, col- the color wheel is the same as the clock. How did you go uphill to 12 noon and suddenly you're going downhill <laughs> in a quantum leap? Every so-called chakra is a wheel that mm-hmm. takes you upward and you go up a floor every, every chakra. Mm-hmm. And all of these so-called chakras are actually what they call the five elements. You have earth, which is precipitation. In other words, you have something solid, you can knock on wood. And then you have water, which is the next level. You have liquid because things have to have electricity and forces like that. Then you have uh, fire, which is basically magnetism. When you see an aura, it's actually a heat signature. And when you look at aurora borealis and the various types of phenomena up in the air, they're magnetic and they're heat oriented. Mm -hmm. Then you have gaseous pressure, which is air. And then you have sonics, which holds everything together. Those are the five levels found in the cymatic machine, which uh, Dr. Manners was correct on that, except he kind of fudged the different signatures that he made up for cymatics. Well, that's interesting about the Aurora Borealis is we're so fortunate last winter. I mean, it was so cold to stand out on the porch, but from the front door, you look across and see above the trees, the Aurora. I think it was like midnight or 1 a.m. But you're saying that's magnetism and heat? Yep, it's actually wow. heat. Heat and magnetism wow. are related, and they're in those wow. levels. So what we call the five chakras, the five tattvas, they used to call them, are the five element law. But people, scientists, they say, oh, there's not five elements. There's a hundred and so many of them. But actually, they were talking of states of mm-hmm. matter. And, of course, you have plasma for heat, and you have a, a liquid state. You have a gaseous state, and you have a solid state. Mm-hmm. So those, what they were talking about is those. Uh, different uh, categories. In the West, they changed that to four elements, like in astrology, yeah. because they mistook sky for air. And sky for air, sky is actually ether or akasha or sonics. Uh, but what? without the sonics, you can't hold yourself together. The sonics holds together. And in fact, now they can actually measure your temperature with sonics. Uh, they have a sonic temperature because every heat has a signature that identifies the exact temperature. Wow. And the five elements, it, it, what is it? Wood, water, fire, air, and what's the other one? Metal, right? Yeah. And wood is actually air. They, the five uh, element law in acupuncture is actually incorrect. And I get uh, in trouble uh, with acupuncturists <laughs> when I say this, but uh, if anyone reads the E Jing, Wood is air and metal 
is is uh, ether or uh, well metal is the same as ether or sonics okay. so they have it those two reverse and wow. even in the book of uh, what is it called the, the book of five elements or something like that there's a famous acupuncture textbook where he says there's something wrong with that law and indeed it's the switcheroo on those two so the the so-called tattvas are more accurate where wood and air are synonymous and then metal is above them and of course they have this thing that you bring the gong and it does this and it does that but actually you can make an analogy the other way just as easily interesting um I wanted to ask you about heavy metals uh, kind of related to minerals and your philosophy on minerals. Cause I know, and I've seen a lot of studies on this and I know your thoughts on, on PubMed and studies, but uh, there's a relationship with like z- excess zinc, cadmium, lead, mercury, arsenic. I think those are the big ones and mineral deficiency, like specifically uh, magnesium, zinc, uh, selenium. I think those are the three I've seen in studies, like basically showing that if someone's zinc deficient, uh, and I think hair tissue mineral analysis, people have showed this too, and then correlated it with the client's symptoms alleviating, mostly neurological. If they have like anxiety or insomnia or depression or whatever, or brain fog, they've seen just like strategically based on the hair, like increasing minerals to depletes the heavy metals and they could correlate that with better brain and emotions and stuff. What are like your thoughts on all that? Like minerals as they relate to heavy metals, because they seem to be on a seesaw, everything that I've read and understood. But it, One of the things is they don't take hierarchy into it. And what, what mm-hmm. do I mean by that? If you go and find out what your minerals are and you get a blood test, what is that really? Are you measuring blood or are you measuring the plasma or the serum? And what about the hair? Is serum. You know, because they don't measure all the parts of the hair. Hmm. The hair has a cell in it. And what part are they? Are they measuring the serum part of the hair, the cellular part of the hair, or the total of them? And because they're not getting the total, they get an incorrect measurement. Now, here's what happens. If you... Uh, if you take uh, potassium and you're low on potassium, it could mean that you're actually overloaded on potassium because in cancer, as much as more than 60% of potassium will go into the cell to feed the cancer. So by giving potassium, you're feeding the cancer. And then if you measure high potassium like you do, it's actually fighting the cancer. So when I do someone... They called us up and said, your potassium is dangerously high. You must come in for a test. It was on Friday. I said, we're going to ignore it. That's a good sign. So we went in there. The cancer miraculously, they thought she was going to be cured out of it. But uh, not understanding the process that was going on when you deal with these people. Because high potassium in the serum can mean low potassium in the, in the blood cell and vice versa. So they never measure like, what is your potassium level in your serum and your interstitial fluid? What is it in the cell, the actual red blood cell or the cells of your body? What is it in the organelles of your cell? What is it in the uh, in the chromomeres and the chromomata and the DNA and etc.? They they measure it in one place and say that's the measurement for the whole body. And actually, they're only measuring in one place. It's like going into a house and looking for a terrorist and just going into the bathroom. Right? They're not here and leaving and not check the kitchen out and the bedroom and the utility room and whatever else. Yeah, I, I love your your perspective on that because me being in like the biohacker space and I follow like the anti-aging people that, you know, are working out and they got the six pack abs and they're doing thousands of dollars of blood work routinely. And they're saying, Oh, my levels are perfect. And they showcase them to kind of prove their program and their, you know, that they know what they're talking about. And I'm not dissing, you know, these people, I mean, a lot, some of them have had on the, on the podcast, but I do think, like you said, I fully, agree that tests are limited, um, especially serum blood tests. I mean, 
I mean, take like fat soluble vitamins. I mean, I could go, um, to the big city nearby and drive an hour and a half and, and test my vitamin E levels. But that's just looking at vitamin E in the blood where what is it in the liver? Right. I mean, I, I think the liver stores as far as the fat soluble vitamins, it doesn't store as much vitamin D. Like people think the liver stores A, D, E, and K equally. They're actually stored at different levels, is my understanding, the liver. Yep. But I think a, vitamin A it holds on to the most, I believe. And they often measure in the wrong place. Like vitamin D is classic. They measure in the blood. Yeah. Vitamin C is a fat soluble vitamin. What's it going to be doing in the blood? <laughs> it's going to be in the liver and in the fat cells because it's fat soluble. So they used to know that some people actually thought vitamin D could last for three years. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But surely nature arranged it so you could survive for an entire season of winter without getting any. And it was known to General Electric back in the day that you could get vitamin D in your body by massaging. You could actually tan yourself by rubbing yourself and other yeah. ways of getting a vitamin D. And in submariners, they did a test, the US Navy, do submariners need vitamin uh, D when they're in, in, in underwater for four months? And they proved they didn't. But now that vitamin D has become popular, suddenly the Navy has changed their results. Well, before it was clear that they didn't need it. So for some yeah. reason, they're really on a tear about vitamin D that you, you can't go with a day without having sun on your body or a spurgy yeah. lamp or something. What's well, interesting, like, uh, I'm sure you know Rhonda Patrick. I think you know all the big names. Like, she'll pop up on YouTube for me, and it's always, you know, omega-3 for muscle gaining or vitamin D for X, Y, Z. Every, almost, like, 99% of her content is omega-3s and vitamin D, and it's really interesting like, to see that. Yeah, it is, <laughs> especially when you have uh, the Apaches – uh, refused to eat anything th uh, that was a fish and anything that an animal that ate a fish, they wouldn't touch. And look at Geronimo. He lived to 80 or 81. And how did he die? He was drunk and fell off his horse and got pneumonia. I mean, he probably would have lived even longer. The, the Apaches were super fit for American Indians compared to a lot of other ones. And they, they were, they were not tall. Apache, I think was named by the Osages as being the short people is what it comes from. It wasn't their name for themselves, but, uh, but they were very fit. And the Navajos also didn't eat fish and neither did the uh, Hopis as well. They had mm. different reasons for not mm. doing it, but, it, but anyway, the, uh, they often make up that you need these certain things when actually the food will provide it. Because if you look back uh, in the days of uh, the silent movies and you see uh, what is his name that used to do all those stunts, he didn't need anything to do those stunts and maintain muscles. They were really strong, flexible people back then. Some of the stuntmen that had to do these stunts back then where they – fell off buildings on the floor flat on their back and survived over and over again. How did they do that? They were, we were a lot tougher back then, mainly because we walked and we weren't sitting around in front of computers all the time, or even I yeah. in libraries, you know, you're not going to get much exercise there except flipping pages. of books. <laughs> yeah. I might've told you in one of our 15 episodes, but I used to sh shoot action films when I was younger with my friends with like a little uh, digital camcorder. And one one night, uh, one shoot, I was dressed as Superman, and I jumped off the roof. We had to do like five takes because he wanted, I wanted me to la like land perfectly with the cape behind me instead of over my head. And I tore the ligament in my knee and ended Ooh. up in a in a cast for like three months. But that nice. speaks to how uh, you know I was eating tons of processed food and uh, it yeah I just tore the ligament from too many jumps. So I, I was not built to be a stuntman for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah even now when i see the cat often jumps off the uh, the ledge down on the cement and hits hard you can tell it even bothers her i feel it in my butt i don't know if other people feel that i feel it like i've i've made that jump <laughs> <laughs> so about uh fish and I, I don't think i've ever taken this direction when you told that story about the 
the Native Americans. Um, I got into fishing last summer and I didn't catch any to eat. I was just experimenting with catch and release, which I found, I think it's like an ancestral thing. I don't know. If, I felt like a, it was like a meditation, but I also like, maybe it was my raw vegan history uh, thoughts kept creeping in, you know, so I'm creating a hole in its, in its mouth and I, I, I pinched the barb. So it's easy to pull out, which is what you do with catch and release. But I was, I mean, I was trying to research online and of course all the forums are like, um, you know, I think 5% out of them will, will die if you keep catch and release. I mean, it's inevitable that one will die. And also maybe food can come out of that hole. Did you did you ever grow up catch and release or your thoughts on it's uh the ethics of it or the fish recovering? Because I was trying to research it and basically most people don't care. They're like, it's fish, don't don't think about it. But I'm like thinking about the fish's trauma and all that stuff, you know. It's like... <laughs> I think about that. I remember when I read uh, during high school, from here to eternity, the generals were talking about a soldier who shoots a bird and puts himself in the in the bird's place is not a good soldier. You can't have right. him think that way. And right. that's true in military life. I tend to do that, too. I think, ah, oh, the poor bird or the poor whatever. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know. Sometimes uh, I, I think most of the fish can survive that kind of uh, thing, and they heal up pretty easily. For some reason, Adonis Lay didn't think that animals felt the same way we do. We like put ourselves in an anthropomorphic situation about what a fish is going to say or a suffering animal, and he didn't think that. And I, I I'm in, I'm on the, uh, what do you call it, in between on that. I don't yeah. know. I hate to see yeah. animals self suffer, and it just didn't bother him. He said he would say, in fact, something like, "If you only understood, if you only understood." Mm. So wow. I don't. <laughs> well, I, I think you might have said or I've heard that, uh, like, there's a collective soul or a collective entity for each species. Like you think, even though they have different personalities, and our cats, hundred percent do. The three cats have very different personalities. So it appears that they're separate souls, but I've heard that it's like there's like an oversoul with animals instead of humans. Is that true? Or your thoughts on that? Or you know, my thoughts on that are I think Donald Lay was onto that pretty much. He said the soul was the soil, and actually it's all is one because you're only made out of what he called 144 elements. They haven't discovered about 20 of those yet, and uh, and he said that. What we call the soul is the individual is the spirit because spirit is the oxygen when we take our first breath. That's why legally, if a baby dies before taking its full breath, you don't need a funeral. But if once it takes one breath, it's a person and now you have to die. He said that's a very important difference. He said he claimed that a, uh, a, 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 a baby that hasn't taken a breath yet is actually a glorified wart which is really controversial wow. nowadays wow. with all wow. that's going on about that. But he said, once you take that first breath, then the consciousness comes in you. Before that, soul is like uh, all knowing uh, all of the minerals together that uh, that comprise what you would call the greater uh, uh, the oversoul, some people call it. Mm. And I've seen that. We tend to overlap with other people. The ESP and those kind of things uh, where you can pick up other people's thoughts and feelings. One of the most dramatic things I ever saw was uh, a couple, the Mutons were the uh, married couple that were going to a Donald school. Their kids started crying and crying and crying and crying. They couldn't stop them. They were going to take them to the emergency hospital. On the way, they said, let's try uh, Adano's clinic. See if Adano can do anything for the kid. So the kid comes in screaming and uh, Adano goes and I happen to be there and Adano goes to work on his feet. Well, the kid starts windmilling with his feet, kicking Adano. So Adano looks annoyed, motions both parents over, rubs both of their left shoulders 
and the kid is asleep in less than a minute, completely asleep. He picks up the kid on his lap, adjusts the neck one way, <laughs> a bunch of vertebrae go. The kid doesn't wake up. He does it again. The kid doesn't wake up. Then he opens his eyes with that kind of a 10,000 yard stare in a 10 foot room, you know, and just stares ahead. And then he says to the, uh, to the, to the father, what did you do to upset him this morning? Oh, I told him I'd take him to the store and I didn't. He said, next time, when you tell him, touch him when you tell him, and you won't have this reaction. So, but then I saw, holy cow, the parent does that. And after that, I would have women as clients with a, a kid throwing a tantrum and running around hyper, you know, pulling things off the wall and everything. And I would massage their feet and put the kid to sleep. Now, I would wow. tell, I, I would say, since the kid is tied in with your womb, before he goes to sleep, he's going to jump on your belly. She says, what? I said, just be prepared. And sure enough, both times I did this, the kid takes a flying leap on her belly and she's prepared for it. And then keeps going, going around and then just fell asleep right on the floor wow. within, within minutes. And so what is that? What is that connection between parents and people? Where does one person begin and the other end? Interesting. Uh, on the the way, I think we were flying uh, uh, flying recently. Did like a short um, Seattle trip. It's my first time over there to Washington, that the west side. And on the plane, there's this crying baby, and it was the worst. I mean, I've flown a lot over the last four years, and <laughs> you know, to California and back to Idaho. And there's a crying baby that just wouldn't stop. And it was like, it was like a movie. It was like a blood curdling. <laughs> ah, like it was in so much pain. I think it was like a little Indian baby and the dad was there trying to calm it down and it must have been 30 minutes straight of it just going nuts and i think wow. even at the airport he was still going nuts after they landed wow. i was wondering if his maybe he couldn't equalize the pressure i'm like that kid's in pain there's something happening there you know the pressure could be a reason yeah that they yeah. weren't doing it and sometimes yeah. the crying will help equalize the, the oh. pressure so it could have been wow. undue pressure. When wow. I went for a pilot's license at one point, I only had one professional lesson uh, yeah. by someone who wasn't just showing me on the side. But uh, when we went down, my ears felt like they were going to break open from uh, from uh, from the altitude change, from not yeah. yawning correctly. <laughs> wow. Uh, speaking of flying, there's, uh, I think two companies, cause I like the tech stuff and just, I think it's going to translate eventually to the health industry. Um, but there's, uh, have you heard of, e uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft Yes. Like, called EV? <laughs> there's two that just came out one that's like 200,000, which to me is a little pr too much. And then there's one that's like a hundred thousand, which is still too much, but each one, it's like a one person aircraft i don't know how high they can go but they can only go like 20 minutes or 20 miles mm. one of those but they seem super dangerous i was reading the comments it was really entertaining and people were like you better have a parachute <laughs> you know? but i'm thinking if i went over the trees i'd parachute it i'd be stuck you know 100 feet up in a tree probably if i had to bail <laughs> off one of those <laughs> we're in for some interesting times i mean they say you could only fly them in rural areas, not in cities and stuff. But I think the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing people in personal aircrafts flying around over our heads. You know, the powers that be don't want you to be flying over their property. That's the <laughs> one problem. If you're in a rural area like up in Idaho, uh, one of the – what do they call it? The personal air aircraft? There's one guy up there I know has one, and he goes flying around, whatever he wants to. Uh, I forget what you call those small aircraft. That like a little Cess off. Cessna or something or – no, it's smaller than that. It's a little oh. bitty personal aircraft that oh. they call, and it's uh, the names, forget it. I, oh. I forget. They also have all those hang gliders. A friend of mine has gone traveled as much as 100 miles by hang glider before, wow. especially over the That's... Owens Valley and places like that. Uh -huh. You get these lifts. Uh, when I used to fly with my friend who had a pilot's license, we would hit a lift and suddenly we'd be a hundred foot higher from these airlifts that would take us up like that. So wow. it, the air, these currents in the air, uh, same thing on the ground. If, yeah. if you're here in Montecito and you walk 
by a like a a, a valley and what do you call it a, a crevice mm-hmm. the air will come back flowing down there and be nice and cool even though it's hot everywhere else so if you go where the canyons are the air comes rushing down there and it's good to build your house if you don't have uh, air conditioning and things like that at the bottom of one of these rivers, uh, unfortunately, water will also follow that way. So you have to be careful of the water coming down, especially here in Montecito. <laughs> didn't didn't the hot air balloons used to be a big thing like the the Zeppelins and big thing. And the, and the, what the, they could do and Ray Pete said they could bring back Zeppelins and carry 2000 people from Europe and back to the United States and back again, but they don't want to do it because they want all these jets and everything oh. else. The, the companies have these patents and they don't want to give them, but we could actually have uh, balloons back and the hydrogen isn't really that explosive. I forget what caused the Hindenburg to go up, but it wasn't necessarily the hydrogen. And I don't believe uh, how many people were killed? I don't think many people were killed yeah. on that because it doesn't really explode like they like an atomic bomb or something like that. Yeah, so I, think, I think I it's think a good idea. Down by you, there's, I mean, there's like Tesla and all the superchargers and stuff, but there's also high. I think the only hydrogen fill stations are like from LA down to San Diego, and I was watching a YouTube of someone filling up um, their car. A hydro, it was like a Hyundai. Hyundai makes a hydrogen vehicle. I can't remember the name of it, um, but it was interesting because it it's a, a pressure hose you connect to the car, and it goes from like a hundred bar to two hundred to three hundred. So like go from low to medium to high pressure, and it'll super cool the hose. That's actually like a super like you know EV cords are super hot, so they need a lot of cooling. For hydrogen, it's like the opposite. I <laughs> guess they get so cold. From the hydrogen running through it but what's awesome is they, it was like five to ten minutes to fill i think it was like seven or eight minutes versus ev it's like 30 minutes to an hour to fill so um i think the only downside is i think you need electricity to make hydrogen is that right so, i think so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's so one more step so it's like electric is first but if you're using electric to make the hydrogen i don't know if it if it's a equalizes as far as the energy usage or but but there are definitely options to yeah. the reason they want us in electric cars is so they can control us they want us mm-hmm. on the grid and actually solar was developed so well in 1952 according to the reader's digest that an expert at mit said they could solarize with permission 80 percent of the world in one year now how come they could do that in 52 and now they need fancier and fancier uh, solar devices, we can get, uh, we can put up telescopes that assemble themselves as they go, send them to exact places in uh, space, but we can't make a simple solar uh, power generator. I mean, obviously we're being lied to. Yeah. I was listening to the CEO of Ford, uh, Jim Farley, I think his name is. Someone said he's related to Chris Farley. I don't know if I believe that, the comedian. But he was saying that I think back in the early 1900s, one third of vehicles were gas, one third were electric, and one third were uh, steam. And nobody knew in the in car industry, you know, because Henry Ford was back there, nobody knew which one was going to win. And uh, I think the electric cars... He was saying you would drive like you would leave them overnight at a building and they would swap the battery for you and return it to your house. <laughs> and that's what they did back then. Instead of charging at home, you would all have a central charging station and then someone would drive it back to your house. But that's pretty fascinating because I thought, you know, everyone here is, you know, EVs are new, but we've had them since like 1900, supposedly, according to the CEO of Ford. So it's true. <laughs> most yeah. cars were electric when they first came out. Yeah. What killed it is spindle top. Spindle top made oil so cheap and you wow. didn't need all the, uh, the anyway, it made it much easier. So even with the cranking and everything they had to do, people switched to it because you could make them so much cheaper. Spindle wow. top is what was the turning The Pennsylvania oil, things like that d- didn't have enough to bring the price down enough. Texas wow. did it. 
Well, I, I agree with you though, with EVs, like the, um, if you're fully off grid and in the summer, if you could charge it only with solar or excess solar, I think that's a win, but probably less than 1% of people are doing that, right? Most are in apartments, they're charging it chargers, they're, um, pulling off the grid, um, but uh, yeah, you're right. It's expensive. I mean, you have to buy panels, you have to buy batteries, the whole thing. It's like a luxury. But then again, I mean, price of diesel, I think here was five bucks last couple of weeks. And I'm wondering if the prices are just going to keep going up and up for gas and diesel to make it, you know, make electric cars more affordable than gas eventually, you know. <laughs> and it, it's uh, simple too. When I was in Bellingham, you know how I warmed our place? I got a simple mirror a simple mirror and aimed it at the window and we just wow. sit in the sun and be warm. <laughs> so wow. Some things are really simple. And, and when I lived in Tucson, I had fragments of mirrors. So I had them all arranged as the sun came in. I was always working on my computer in the sun because it came in the window and I was perfectly comfortable without wow. uh, having a, 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 any type of heater. Wow. Just so, reflecting the sun. Yeah. And also yeah. there's uh, what you call uh, X energy. Like, uh, I, have you heard of the Hutchinson effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he was John, an interesting guy. Yeah, he, he was a client of mine. He took solar <laughs> classes up in Bellingham. And when I met him, he was on the lam because uh, the Canadian government said he was a quack and none of his stuff worked until both Japan and Germany were bidding on his anti-gravity machine. So oh. they put they just they locked up his uh, lab, put a warrant on his arrest. And when I met him, he was hiding out on an Indian reservation outside of Bellingham. And how he oh. ended up taking a solar glass, his car happened to break down in front of the place where I did the workshop. So he said, he said, I might as well take your workshop. So he came in and, and then he was a client. We dealt with uh, his astral project, uh, wow. projection and where the trauma came from with mind hacking. Wow. And he's an interesting guy. He now, his things seem quaint if you look at him, mm -hmm. but that's because he doesn't have the money to do mm -hmm. the, the things. If they gave him the money, he could solve a lot of the world's problems. Same thing with water. We have primary water. We have the humidity in the air that can mm -hmm. be taken out directly. We have no water shortage. All of these shortages are so people can make money on it. Yeah, it's, it's funny, the Indian reservation thing, because we... Uh, uh, Last year, we watched, it, it was a chore. We watched every season of the old X-Files. Once it was new, it was horrible. It was like Disney taking over Star Wars. You know, they just <laughs> ruined it. But uh, Fox Mulder hid, at the, I think it was like season eight or nine near the end. He was hiding in an Indian reservation. So I wonder if uh, Hutchinson took that from the X-Files. <laughs> it was like have. a safe place. Yeah. <laughs> Could have. They, uh, the, in Bellingham, they allowed him to stay there. And so oh. it, I, I met another friend uh, named Leon. She, I was I was teaching Sufi workshops with the Sufi drumming and everything. And she showed up and then she told me about John. And then he came down right after that escape. She went up to check out his anti-gravity machine and they both came back because he was on the lamb then. he also was having a problem with uh, he was uh, his girlfriend was a prominent film director and they had a falling out so he was uh, really in bad shape at that time but he's an interesting guy really fascinating and highly inventive creative people like that get sidelined they don't give them any money so what are they going to do so all they can do is they, they basically he takes junk and puts it together and levitates bowling balls and things like yeah. that. You can find videos of him doing yeah. that. Yeah, the YouTube, guy. the YouTube series, I think I saw, it was like, it was kind of short. It was like a news segment, but they go into his apartment and there's all these computers and things and it's really narrow and they walk through and he's showing a few of his experiments to the interviewers. Um, yeah. really it's the real deal. And there are other yeah. people that uh, use that type of energy, too, that I've met that are, again, sidelined. They they yeah. don't want them to do that. John Nordberg can take uh, can solve all the water problems in the world and even re uh, 
the Sahara Desert, he can fix that problem, but wow. they don't want to listen to him. And it's it's yeah. as simple as the old swamp cooler. It's a giant yeah. swamp cooler. You just dig a hole in the ground and uh, and, and then uh, have a well coming out. Also, uh, what was his name? The famous uh, horticulturist. Uh, he actually said that back in the day, they had air transport in New mm. York and Chicago was running it where the trains would be propelled by air pressure in the oh. same way you go to a bank and, you know, they shoot mm. those things out. Yeah. Well, the post office in New York was at one time was run by all the deliveries were done by those, by those little uh, tunnels with, uh, with the mail in those containers to do that. And wow. then the oil companies came and, went to all the libraries in the world and destroyed all the books on that technology. Yeah. I, we were talking about Elon earlier. I like the hyperloop idea. And I think he's talked about in interviews, like the traffic problem. And fortunately, one of the main reasons I live in Idaho, we don't have traffic problems because everyone can't stay in the snow and the cold, you know, it's only right. a small percentage of us that can live through the winters like this. Not, you know, but just what it is. But uh, down in California, it's like traffic's a real problem. Elon's solution, uh, instead of going Star Wars, flying cars, or uh, what is it? Uh, what was that? Minority Report, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like fast elevators, the Tom Cruise thing. Up the. It, instead, he was saying go subterranean and go like these tight maglev underground things to where... That's the best way to transport people around. Or I forget if it was driving or maglev or both, but he's like, basically we can go underground and there's like several miles we can create lanes under the earth and that would solve all the traffic issues was his solution. Even Illich is one of my favorite experts and he said the solution to our transportation problem is to limit the speed limit to 18 miles an hour. <laughs> and he said, be, be, back when it was lower, you get more people able to travel all over the place. Like back in the 30s, they encouraged people to jump on trains and go yeah. to pick fruit and stuff because they wanted them. Only after the Depression started that they start bonking people on the head and even killing some of the hobos that went that way. And he said a perfect example at one time was Thailand, where they had all these reservoirs. And people just paddled any place they wanted to and went. He said, what happens, the faster the speed limit, the more limited it is for transportation and the more expensive it, where only a certain amount of people can't uh, travel. And I've heard of people in the ghetto in Watson, places like that. They're 30 years old and have never seen the Pacific Ocean, even though it's 20 miles away. So something's wrong with their transportation. And now we want the animals to be able to rewild them. They're going to spend $10 million to cut a larger hole under the freeway here and mess up uh, Highway uh, 101 so that they can let uh, wolves walk through the, uh, the thing. $10 million. While all these homeless people, we have, uh, I forget how many thousand in this county alone now california has homeless people all over the place i mean it's getting worse and worse and worse they're trying to put them in 15 minute cities and everything and make uh, cars illegal and it's it's absolutely ridiculous here in california well you yeah. know you you went you tried to move back it didn't quite work out well when i was going to uh community college in downtown san diego like the city community college i had a or no it was usd yeah i had a teacher that she was really uh, uh, empath empathetic for the homeless people. And she, uh, I think we spent like a whole day talking about how they're putting spikes on the benches and making it harder and harder for them to sleep in public areas. And in the back of my head, I'm like, isn't that a kind of a good thing? Like people might get angry at me, but it's like, let's push them in a better direction than sleeping outside. Like there's, I think there's a better solution than that. I mean, there has to be, but George Carlin's solution was give him the golf courses. Yeah. <laughs> he says, you got so many golf courses there, there, just let him camp out on the golf courses. <laughs> yeah. It's funny up here, there's so much snow that, uh, I mean, there's way less home. I mean, more when you get east into Washington or west into Washington, there's more. But the colder it gets, I mean, we don't see them in the winter. I don't know. 
What, how, where do they in go? New York, you do, but they have ways yeah. to hide. And, you know, right. there's a lot of underground New York that they can right. hide in places like that. Same in Vegas. You'd be surprised how much of underground facilities are in Vegas or in uh, various big cities that you can get under and live in. And wow. uh, they do that in New York. I, wow. I was amazed at the amount of homeless people in New York City when I was back there in 1980. God knows what it's like now with all the immigrants coming in, too. Wild. It's wild. <laughs> um, let's see. What else today? So we had a bunch of questions, but I did want to, my last note here to talk about, and I think this is probably one, another, I, I like bringing up triggering topics is the genetics thing. And you're very outspoken that, genetics is a scam and actually on the plane ride i was listening to our mutual friend justin uh, extreme health radio and you were on his show i don't know if it was a repeat i always have trouble figuring out if it's a repeat or a recent show but it was one he posted of you and you were uh going into genetics and how um we can control it with our minds and i think you know bruce slipped in and that is a common thing that i've heard about the last 10 years in the health community is epigenetics trumps genetics but I've also had PhDs on the show and granted they're biased because their whole business is based around mm -hmm. genetics, <laughs> but they say that's incorrect. That epigenetics is not everything. It's something, but it's not everything. And I, that resonated that. Uh, I don't know. I uh, like the older chronologically I get, I, I usually think it's both instead of one or the other. That's just from all my extreme experiments and stuff. I'm like, usually the truth I'm finding is in between. So it's not only epigenetics, it's not only genetics, it's a blend. And I guess what percentage of the blend is people's interpretation, right? But Mind is the ultimate, but getting a person to that state is really, really difficult. Now, genetics is like a step in a process. And back in the day, I knew that there were things that controlled genetics. So when Scientific American posted a picture of proteonomics, which is a state below genetics. I went to my friends and said, look, see, that's what I've been telling you about. Proteonomics controls genetics. So you just put a Trojan horse in to destroy genetics. So genetics is a measuring. It definitely can tell your past. Uh, for instance, uh, iridology can actually tell your past and your history and your parental diseases and what you're liable to get. But it's not guaranteed. It can still change it, but it's there. But that would be saying, OK, I can change my eyes and now I can change my life. So it is a history of your life, but not necessarily a history of your future. But it, it, it's a record of it. Obviously, you have Down syndrome. It's going to be there, and that's right. hard to change. But the genetics is a picture of it. It actually happened from proteonomics, glyconomics, ionomics. They have all these nomics in between. And why they have stopped at the genetic level is patentable. Then they can patent and make a whole bunch of money. You can't do it on proteonomics. You can't do it on glyconomics. You can't do it on all these other nomics. So they pick a level that they can. And that's what's become uh, – genetics could be very valuable. But they also want to control people. So you probably saw 23andMe was hacked. And, really? and by millions of people have been hacked. So they know all about your vulnerabilities, and they can actually make – uh, uh, I don't want to use the words, but they can make things that attack your individual weapons. genetics by that yeah. way, bioweapons. Yes, they wow. can. And that was exposed by New Scientist magazine in 2002, where the, un where, where the U.S. Navy was doing experiments to get both genetic types and other racial types and also individuals and that they could kill them with various bioweapons. Wow. But I guess my mentality with that is sending your saliva in for DNA analysis. They already have all that anyway, right? What do you what are your thoughts on that? A lot of times they do. <laughs> you have a point. Was it our, our uh birth certificates traded on the stock market and all that, right? I mean they they got us from the start. <laughs> if you're yeah. born in a hospital. 
Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> they they want this genetic base so they can control it because it does give you information. You know, you mm-hmm. can actually tell a lot and you can backtrack track into proteonomics and elsewhere. But through mesmerism, which has been forgotten, it, mesmerism was once as well known as uh as say Elvis or whatever back in the day, the whole world knew about mesmerism and that mesmerism worked. Mesmerism is now called kinesiology, where you can up and down a person's unlock a meridian and and lock it up. Uh, But it works beyond suggestion. See, they want to say, oh, it's suggestion, like hypnosis is suggestion. But one time I was on a radio show uh, in person on the AM radio show and the guy uh, I showed him how to go up and down and weaken him he said well that's suggestion though I said do you have anybody in the station that uh, is not listening to the show yeah we got an engineer back there bring him out so I went to this guy and I said this is going to make you stronger than you've ever been before and of course I went down the birdie and which weakens and he went right down. He laughed at me. He said, that didn't work, did it? I said, oh, no, I get, well, let me try something else. So I went like this. This is going to make you weaker than it's ever been before. And he was strong. Ha, see, I'm stronger. And the radio wow. announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, we're on radio, but I'm here to see. I just saw one of the most amazing things in my <laughs> life that this guy didn't. It wasn't suggestion. He actually used the energy of that. Wow. So mesmerism has an effect and they knew about it and they deny it because Charles Dickens was a mesmerist. All kinds of famous people were mesmerists and they covered it all up because mesmerism can cure many diseases where you can basically uh, get rid of a disease or a genetic disease even uh, by mesmerism and even uh, access uh, super personality. So where a person oh. who is afraid of heights can walk across a beam a thousand feet high and not be bothered with it at all, unless you happen to wake them up and suddenly they realize where they are and fall. Well, so, did, did you see that documentary, the guy that did that between the World Trade Center? The Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not my cup of tea. <laughs> As someone said, it's your imagination that gets you because if you can do a plank like that on a level floor, but once you get above ground, you start your imagination of you falling cuts in. It's interesting that the American Indians were used to build most of New York at one time because they had no fear of heights for wow. whatever reason. So they had uh, they had the, the Iroquois Indians, particularly, they had them doing almost all of that structural work where you see them on top of buildings, you know, on, on a railing you know, above everything else like that. What do you think about Elon Musk's uh, uh, dream of like, like I actually saw the Tesla bot in person at the mall uh, a couple days ago, which is, it looks, I mean, the, that, Will Smith movie was it I Robot or something? It kind of looks like that. Like they're a little eerie, but I think his dream is have them work all the Tesla factories and have them do all the menial labor. I mean, he wants to sell these for twenty grand, which I think is the first one's going to be like a hundred k, no doubt. I mean, that's he's not going to sell that for twenty thousand, but you know, to do dishes, to do your laundry, to do tasks that no one wants to do, maybe janitorial work. Do you think that's going to happen in the next like ten years or? That's what they're planning to happen. I'm for technology for getting us into space. I think eventually, if we want mankind to persist, this planet's going into the sun eventually. So I've always been a fan of getting us off the planet. And uh, and whether the moon event and during the Kennedy thing was a fake, if it was, it was a really good one because I was involved in the space industry at that time. And we all thought it was real. Yeah. Uh, but regardless of whether whether it was real or not if we don't get off space mankind is gone while people uh certain uh uh, people i've followed say that we actually can colonize the entire universe we can have trillions of people i'm also into julian simon who said that uh he was for birth control at one point when he saw the war memorial uh in washington and he said what if those What if all those people that weren't killed were still alive? Did we kill Mozarts? Did we kill all these people? So he changed his mind. He said, we need more people because the creativity will solve all our population problems and everything. 
And he won a bet with uh, what's the guy who was so into the uh, population being destroyed and everything like that. Mm-hmm. He won a bet with him where the guy actually paid him a hundred dollars for the, he said, all the minerals are going to be gone and we have more and more minerals. So creativity is the important thing. And uh, Julian Simon is a very interesting person who is uh, not quoted too much anymore. Wow. Yeah. I've heard, um, like I, uh, World War II is fascinating to me and, and what really happened there, right? Because it's uh, such a heated topic. But I think the fact is, and nobody can get triggered by this statement, we, America took its strongest men and Germany took its strongest men and Japan took its strongest men and Italy took its... So you have four countries that took its strongest men and just wiped them out. You know, how many millions died? It's like... That was a lose for the entire world, that whole situation. And obviously, war is, war is, but that one specifically, I mean, because those countries were, I mean, think about Japan at that time. They were, I think, way better than they are now back then. Um, so it's it's a tragedy. I mean, we lost a ton of strong men, create, creative men, men that could have invented free energy things. Who knows, right? It's like... You know, the first people that were pilots in Japan were the samurai, and they were basically supermen. They learned to see stars in the daytime and could watch wow. the constellation, and that gave them a, 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 uh, an advantage as a pilot. They could see an enemy plane minutes before they could see them and get in position to come up from the sun behind where they couldn't see him and get him. And they had such fast reflexes that one time the car went off the edge of the cliff with four samurai in it. And they all jumped out of the car just in the, in one split second to get out of it. Now with seat belts, they might have a problem with that. But back then there were no seat belts. So uh, when they ran out of samurai, then they convince people to be basically uh, to crash and burn. What do they call those? Uh, kamikaze. Kamikaze, yeah. yeah. Kamikaze to come down and uh, just uh, and kill people that way because they they told them, you're going to go to heaven for the more people you kill or whatever yeah. they told them. But Pearl Harbor was a false flag, right, which is well known. So that was a fake. Right? There is an yeah. argument about that. Uh, one said that Roosevelt did it, and the other said that the Dulles brothers did it, and mm. that they murdered Roosevelt. So there's wow. two sides to every story, and I haven't made up my mind on them. But definitely, uh, one reason they did that is a, a lot of people in concentration camps would be dead if we didn't get in that war. So uh, the thing is, our country was a Nazi country at that time because Hitler got all of his ideas from Stanford. <laughs> And the eugenics movement in this town, in this country, it was not started by Galton, like they say. It was studied by someone called Lady Eugenics, who was a Wall Street broker and advisor to the Vandenbergs. And they started the the genetics movement, the eugenics movement. And of course, Rockefeller, all of those were contributing money for eugenics. They still have the eugenics office on Long Island. And they just they didn't even bother to change the address. They just changed the name to the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory for cancer now. And they still are interested in eugenics. Now it's called molecular biology. Wow. Well, like you said, there's there's two there's always two sides to every story. And I completely agree. Um, Yeah, it's it's funny. Uh. Uh, my buddy Luke Story, he interviewed Alex Jones recently, and he got a lot of flack for that, which is hilarious. Because I think Alex, you know, he's there's some truth with misinformation in there, and um, uh, yeah, a really uh, interesting interview he posted a week ago on Band dot Video was uh, he debated Brother Nathaniel Kapner, which is uh, you know, he was uh, he questions the whole um, World War II thing, and he. Yeah, and he was actually raised as a messianic Jew, um, and his dad uh, called non-Jews goyim. So it was a fascinating interview, and I, I think we need more of that discussion, kind of just to, you know, without emotions. I think that alone is kind of a a test for how balanced of individuals we are. If we don't get let our emotions get in the way of of uh, critical thinking, because I think yeah. that's that's the goal, right? That's the real. Uh, control grid is when they have our emotions 
overriding our critical thinking. And I think that's where most people are today, right? <laughs> that's one reason we listen to a guy named David Knight, if you've ever heard about yeah. him. He's an anti-Alex all the way. <laughs> he doesn't have a single show where he doesn't criticize <laughs> Alex. And now it's come out that Trump knew Epstein for 20 years and they got women together and they got younger women together. So they they blame Clinton. One side blames Clinton. One side uh, blames Trump. And when the, when uh, they're interviewed, when the Republicans interviewed, they never mentioned Trump had anything to do with pedophile island. When he did, he, he went, went there and other places. And uh, so one side hides one part of the story and the other mm-hmm. side mm-hmm. hides the other part. That's, of the yeah. That's how it always is. Yeah. The, the Stephen Hawking thing is fun. So many memes are coming out of the Stephen <laughs> Hawking that he went there, you know, like so many funny wheelchair memes and scenes from movies that they're splicing in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny now I, I predicted and now it's starting to happen that during the sixties, every rock star, was having sex with someone under 18 years old. Everyone uh, without fear. Now, the first one to get sued is Steven Tyler. He's wow. getting sued now. But there's going to be more. They're going to start all this thing. And actually, it's a funny thing. Uh, the women's suffrage movement in Texas in 1900 made a dramatic thing. They raised the legal marriage age for women from 9 to 10. So young women have been involved for a long time and it's going to take a while to get it out of our system because there's going to be, there there are actually three levels of pedophilia, the 16 to 18, the 14 to 16, and then the kids. And there's different levels. I think, uh, I think a lot of the people like Epstein, except he might have been involved in the transport from Ukraine of child body parts that is not good. The yeah. other things, it's nothing that a rock star didn't do or that any yeah. politician has been guilty of doing for decades. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of the, like, it's funny when I stopped watching uh, mainstream TV, it was uh, the daily show with John Stewart and the Colbert report. Cause I thought they were the last bastion for truth. And this is when I was still, yeah, you know, in a brain fog. And then I just saw, I was, you know, as I started getting healthier and and working on my physical body, my mind got clearer. And I was like, oh, these are controlled agents. And then recently you had, what was it, two years ago, Stephen Colbert on a show dressed up as a syringe and he was dancing on stage, right? It was just too much. Yeah. And yeah. then shaming everybody else for, for not following the government program, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting kind of getting back to you. I like that you said whether the moon landing was real or not, because I think a lot of like the flat earthers and I have friends that are, they hyper focus on that. And if that didn't happen, then you have to question all this, but do you, or could they have just, that could have been a stage but the real moon landing happened behind the scenes and it wasn't recorded. And we do have bases. I mean, there's some interesting photos and books. I mean, I recently bought one on Mars and there's like the face on Mars. There's different statues that were like, there's artifacts that they erased from Google Mars. Like, you know, like Google earth, they used to have like Google Mars. If you zoom in now, there's things they pixelated that before they were detailed and people have recorded this that they hid things on Mars. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, the book I read, I can't remember. It was like the explosion on Mars. The guy made a case and I read the whole book. He was saying that there was a civilization there and there was a nuclear event and there's still artifacts there that they're hiding from us, that a civilization lived there. There could have been people on there at one time. And now they're of course trying to get back there. Did you know that they, they NASA showed a video of a kitty cat 17 million miles in space. No, I think they hid that after that because maybe people started thinking, wait, isn't that cruel? Send a kitty out to space by himself? And what, what is he going to do? Obviously, he's going to die out there in outer wow. space. Uh, but wow. he still has at 17 million miles to get to Mars. He's got 200 million miles. <laughs> so he's got wow. a long way to go to Mars. So wow. we're de- definitely going to have to do. And that's one thing I think transhumanism might have a factor because they're going to have either 
hibernation technology, which is a possibility, or some kind of transhuman thing to get us to Mars. On, on this planet, I'm against, against it, and even most robotics. Though I think uh, we're, we, it's too late now. Japan runs on robotics. A lot of other mm -hmm. countries are running on more robotics than we are. Korea, right, I think? Yeah. North okay. Korea. Yeah, North Korea is one that's, uh, I mean, and look at all they produce. That little country is going up in the satellites and everything, supplying ammunition to Russia. Holy cow. They're obviously producing more than other countries. How does that little bitty country do so much? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I question the Putin hate, though. I'm a, I'm a fan of Vladimir Putin. I think he's awesome from what I've heard. Um, so we'll see. Like you said, there's always two sides and. Usually when they're demonizing, and when I hear them demonizing Russia, I'm like, they're probably good. That's where my mind immediately goes. You know? My view on uh, Putin, he's my favorite villain right now. I'd have <laughs> dinner with him before I'd have it with Clinton or Trump. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, Russia has uh, dictatorial things. They're, they're, they really have problems. But at this point, they're ahead of us. We're worse but they're already getting into uh, CBDC and all that kind of control. But yet Florida doesn't have it. They have laws against it. Yet uh, Mercola didn't do well. They took all his employees bank funds out of Florida. So yeah. and, and Mercola. So obviously uh, you don't need CBDC to uh, control people. And, and like you say, we already have a lot of this genetic information and everything from the time you're born where they get all the information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm with you to use technology to get us to space. I mean, a lot of people don't, they believe that a vacuum can't exist, you know, that, that it's all impossible and stuff. But I mean, out here, I have a telescope I could look up. It's like, it has to be a pretty elaborate scam for them to make holograms in the sky that I could look through and see with my telescope and my night vision, go a military grade night vision goggles. I could look up and see the Starlink satellites moving and there's a lot you, you know, can exactly, see with your naked eye yeah you know exactly like my, my brother keeps up on that so when i visited him in uh at lake tahoe uh we went out we knew when it was coming over and when the clouds parted there it was so just yeah. right on time those are not balloons <laughs> and we have thousands and we have space debris out there and they're even just recently sent uh, a bunch of remains of famous people up into outer space and like they got dead bodies floating around there now too or ashes wow yeah. wow yeah I, I still don't get why people get so heated about that i mean i was i was in it for maybe six months to a year that kind of religion of uh, that that we're talking about you know satellites are balloons and <laughs> you know planes aren't flying as high as they say they are and etc I, I just don't see how it applies I mean, to me, how do I apply it to living off grid to where I could see a benefit in my life? I can't. Therefore, it doesn't matter. That's kind of my mentality with all that stuff with flat earth. It's like, how does how does that change my off grid life? Does it help me live off grid? No, it doesn't matter. It's a waste of time to think about, in my opinion, but I don't know. And of course, as a kid, I was I was raised on uh, uh, Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and Tom Corbett's Space Cadet and Captain Video and his Video Rangers and Beyond Earth and Twin Earths and all of these science fiction things. And as a as a teenager, I think I was only 11 or 12 years old. I belonged to the Bergen County Astronomical Society, and we had access to the world's largest refractive telescope and so oh. i've looked closely at the rings of saturn and the craters of the moon and everything like that and so i was a big believer in it in the fourth grade though my math teacher said you got to know math to go be an astronaut and i was devastated <laughs> i gotta know math <laughs> but now i see school teachers and people even get to go up you know they take yeah. them up yeah. even the star trek star went up and they're not really going up into space they're going into uh not even low earth orbit they're they're getting up when we have all these successful space launches with uh with uh like elon musk and uh jeff bezos mm -hmm. and people like that but i believe 
there is a future in space and that we can get there. And I've been a big fan of it for throughout my life uh, and help with Litton Industries making the gyro systems for not only the F-111 and a lot of other aircraft, but also the space program. Yeah. And we had the zero defect then, which made sense because you have one flaw in the space vehicle and that's it. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the big argument is uh, – is that we haven't been back. And then you have quotes from these people saying where we destroyed the technology from a former, you know, NASA engineer and stuff. I've heard all the arguments and I used to be there, like I said, but that, that is a question that I think there is their only valid point. Why haven't we been back to the moon, you know, human, human boots on the ground and why haven't we landed on Mars yet? Um, but mainly the moon. And that is a valid question that I don't have an answer for because they, you know, they're still getting billions of dollars. I mean, they're still getting funding, right? Should we cut NASA's funding or I, yeah, I don't think, I don't think NASA is trustworthy. I agree with them on that. <laughs> Nixon cut it, but NASA is mostly not interested in getting us to the moon. Right. In fact, uh, I actually exposed one of their scams one time. Yeah. I at one time lived near NASA Bay and right within walking distance of NASA. So they had an open house and I went there and you could ask questions. There were astronauts and scientists. So I said, uh, how come you're saying that, uh, what was it? They were claiming that there was polynuclear hydrocarbons, I believe it was. How come you're saying that's only on planets because it's well known that it's in outer space? Man, did they attack me. Suddenly, instead of one taking a turn, they all came at me with the microphone. Wow. I'm saying, what is this about? Huh. So then I went to the library at the University of Houston after that to validate that I wasn't making this up. And it was clear that they polynuclear hydrocarbons are floating around in space all over the place. Then I realized that Clinton wanted to get the money for NASA for the Mars shoot and all of that. So it was all a, a financial scam deal. But wow. uh, N NASA cannot be trusted. I agree with yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's the benefit of other non-government non agencies. And people would say, oh, Elon Musk's a government plant, right? And so they would go there. <laughs> but... Even the Hunt brothers at one time, I believe it was the Hunt brothers were going to do a space launch in the Indian reservations because they could do wow. it there and couldn't do it in the United States back in the day. Wow. So I, I think a private industry is the best way. And right here at Vandenberg Space Force now, uh, I think we I think they may have launched something last night. They're always wow. launching something. Mm -hmm. And there is a plan here in Montecito similar to Moonraker, the James Bond movie, where they're going to go up in space while the Earth gets leveled and then they come down after it's all over. So I, I think that's a bit radical, but they actually are. It, it, they bought out privately part of Vandenberg so that they could do private experiments and they have plans to get millionaires in space or billionaires in space. Wow. So that is true. That is true. I'm li living here in Montecito and I found that out in the local papers. Wow. Well, it's funny, like talking about uh, was the Hutching Hutchinson. And if we we're using his technology, you know, I feel like we would have already been there. I mean, I'm off grid and it's awesome, but I still have like, what was it hundred year old technology, solar panels and the batteries and propane and generator I'm still in the stone age. Right. <laughs> So. Do you know, in 1901, they used solar power in outhouses in Florida? So wow. how did they live there back then? It worked. It kept the light on in the lighthouse, at least, because they have plenty of sun down there. But I was really surprised. I, I at one time went up to Wisconsin, and that's really snow country, right? And I was seeing all the solar solar panels all over everybody was running on solar and even i stayed at someone's house we had an underground house he didn't need any heat during the summer because it was all i mean during the winter because yeah. it was all underground he parked above the house and he had a greenhouse facing the where the sun was mostly going to shine so he could be growing his garden there wow. but anyway i asked about it and they said well they already had two nuclear power things and they said, you need another one or you can't survive. 
And the public voted it down, said, we're not going to do it. So then what did they do? The power company sold you the off-grid material to put out yourself, and everybody was off-grid doing it. There was more solar power there in the snow working wow. successfully. You don't need the heat. All you need is direct sunshine. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to work as well in the fog. But you can be in Alaska in a place where there's no fog, and you can run it. The heat is not part of the solar power, which surprised me i did not know that <laughs> well like today it's super overcast and i have uh i don't know 45 panels I, I, so, like three arrays but basically as long as i keep the snow off even on today where it's been gloomy all day long i still make enough power to run everything and charge the batteries so it's it's just a matter of getting more like getting enough for a gloomy day basically is what i learned but it's so expensive. I mean, that's it's it is not uh yeah, it's it's not practical for everybody. I mean, I think the grid it's not as reliable, but it's so much cheaper to just pull from the grid. <laughs> yeah. There's some to that. And and that could be done. We're we're wasting a lot of the grid things. In fact, the smart meters are actually raising people's electric prices. And here here they're running a scam. They said they're going to give them all these tax benefits if they put the solar power in. So our landlords did. But now, unless they register a certain way, they get taxed on it. They get all these extra things because Edison and the other companies want to be supplying the electricity. If they're off grid, they lose customers. So they've been fighting it. That's why all these uh off power sections where you transport it and waste all that electricity and transmission when you can do it directly. Anyway, there's more practical solutions. And a friend of mine, Ed Maynard, was the fourth maker, uh, largest maker of ingots in the country. And he had bought an old Exxon uh, wind power thing and they were going to convert it to uh, solar till his friend dipped him out of the money. <laughs> wow. wow. Interesting. Yeah, there's. I'm excited. That's, you know, I, I, I kind of dabble in the extraterrestrial topic and, and um, like Linda Moulton Howe is probably my go-to and there's a couple others that are, but uh, you know, Stephen Greer is like mainstream and I'm talking I'm way beyond ancient aliens, history channel stuff. But I do like that he focuses, Greer focuses on the technology suppression because that is the focus that that's, that is what matters the most to me. I mean, if I could, instead of, taking 12 hours with the layovers and everything to fly down to my family in San Diego, if I can get there in 30 minutes or an hour, that would change my entire life. Like, so. (laughs) They they have those technologies. Definitely. You know, look at the Manhattan project. How many people didn't know about it until they dropped bombs. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That was kept secret. They're usually, you can guess the technology they have is uh, 10 to 20 years behind of what you're Mm -hmm. hearing. And uh, just like 5G, they're on 6G right here in Santa Barbara, and they're on quantum computers out in Goleta. They have all this stuff already, and they're just not releasing it. My friend worked for Texas Instruments. He was sent to Japan, and this is in 1962, and he saw a flat screen TV, and he said, oh, boy, I can't wait to get back to the United States and get a flat screen TV. And they said, that's not how it works. (laughs) We got to sell all the other stuff first. So when did flat screen TV come 20 years later in the nineties, I think before it came out. Wow. Yeah. And he was seeing it in Japan in 1961. I just watched a a YouTube last night of a L it was like a technology conference and it was LG, you know, it makes washing machines and stuff. And I guess they're working on a car. And there's a concept car, but I, I guess a lot of future car brands now are taking out the steering wheel, you know, kind of like the movies where I don't know if they're self-driving, but I think the steering wheel is optional. So you press a button and it will like come out from the dash if you want a physical steering wheel. But I guess those are going away in the next two or three years. What I've yeah. been hearing. And they are running <laughs> over people. You don't hear about that. San Francisco has a lot of taxis now that are like that. And they, they made them stop for Halloween so they didn't run over any kids. <laughs> well, there is uh, back to like there's two sides because I know um, I mean, I've been I, I've been following technology for years. And I think when the Chevy Volt came out, Obama was like a hardcore promoter of it. Like he had like an unveiling and stuff, you know, Barack Obama. And I guess he, Elon's been public saying Obama 
like ignored Tesla while he was promoting Chevy for some reason. I don't know, a money so thing. Biden, some... Same thing. And they just recently came out with a Netflix movie where all the self-driving cars are like crashing like Hillary Swank or some big actress. And, hmm. you know, it's like a sensationalist Netflix movie now, basically like an Elon Musk hit piece on yeah. Tesla. So I'm, I'm starting to want, you know, and it's always obviously, you know, it's, uh, it, it's murky waters, right? It's like, just because they're hating on Elon and Tesla doesn't mean it's an angelic company, but I'm going to start to question whether I should hate Elon or Tesla if they're like promoting this propaganda movie on Netflix of all the Teslas crashing into each other and causing a pile up and all this stuff. It's, it's you know, the way Elon talks, I can't really hate him, but <laughs> yeah. I'm on his, on the other side of many of the issues he's in, yeah. but I kind of like yeah. the guy. And yeah. recently I read a, uh, biography by of him by someone who's really tapped into the new world order though really well but the biography was really interesting about how he uh he fights his beliefs and even would get beat up so many times by no matter how big the bully he would insist on uh on confronting them you know wow and that's just his manner he'll risk all his money and everything but here he is the <laughs> richest person in the world he must be doing something right <laughs> Yeah, I like that he's outspoken against uh, the racism against whites because I, I've experienced that in San Diego several times in the workplace, um, uh, discrimination for my race uh, several times in the last decade. And I think there was like a shooting where, you know, in the news, they always say it's a white uh, supremacist. And he confronted the news anchor and said, that was BS. That was a propaganda company that pushed that story because the news anchor was just regurgitating that garbage and Elon challenged it. He said, no, I'm correcting you. It wasn't a white supremacist. That's been proven false. And it's like, because they are pushing this narrative that all the crazy shooters are always white supremacists. And that's, it's uh, just for that alone. I like that he's combating that stupid because it's, it makes my life dangerous when I go down to San Diego and they look at me like that, like, because they have this ingrained in their mind that I could potentially shoot the place up just because of my skin, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, back in the day I was, uh, when I was in grammar school, I was defending the Jews and the teacher said, now it's okay to be, to do what you're doing, but don't threaten to beat up everybody if they, if they don't like Jews. <laughs> and, and the same with blacks. I saw there's something wrong with that, but now it's turned out the yeah. other way. Flipped, it's, yeah. it's really surprising how fast it's turned to that uh, to me, uh, any color should be okay. And we shouldn't, uh, these, these new, uh, uh, rules are actually racist. They're yeah. not anti-racist. You judge a person by individual, not by race or creed or whatever. I I tend to look at a person. What are they like? That person. Mm -hmm. And I have black friends. I have white friends. I have red friends. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing I noticed after World War II is was it the Kalergi Plan? You could look it up. They they flooded immigrants right after Germany fell. Right after is a red flag for me. Europe was flooded with immigrants and they absolutely raped Europe, turning it Muslim. And to me, that's a, like the a biggest question mark of did the good guys win if they completely decimated Europe of its native population? Because now they say white people don't have culture. Well, yeah, because you destroyed European culture and, and completely erased it from the history books by flooding the flooding all European countries with immigrants um, and they just decimate the women. It's it's really sad. Yeah. yeah. And to complicate it, the, the force rack still exists. I met, strangely enough, a black man who was a lawyer and a doctor in Texas who was hosting 40 of the Forest Rack people at his ranch. And he said, Texas is notorious for Forest Rack because they own the horse ranches because eugenics came out of horse racing. That's why it's so big in Virginia and so big in in, in any state that has large horses, it, oh. horse populations, including California. California used to have a lot of horses and so did Florida. So it gets complicated with everybody always against each other. You always got to have a David Duke or a, or a Joe Biden going against each other. And North Idaho too, right? It has a history. 
Yeah, and this was brilliant, by the way, doing what they're doing in Gaza because now it splits the left and splits the right. Everybody's split. They want people split up. Mm-hmm. They don't want them to join together because That's enough sure. people were coming together against Ukraine that they realized they had to do something. These people, see, most of us are have other things to do in our life. We have to pay our bills, do everything. We don't have time to do this. The government pays people. How can we put it over on the population. So they have all these experts that work PR and work suggestion, hypnotism, mesmerism, all of these things, that's where it's gone. The psychology movement we have today for people, for the average person, is drugs. That's all it is. Back in the day when Freud and Adler and those people, they knew how to control people and to, and but wanted to cure them of it now the psychologists are used to screw us over that's what they're being yep. used for and they're there my favorite book uh you know forced forced reading curriculum in school i think this was in junior high school was uh brave new world that was my favorite book that i read in all my call uh, all my former education year <laughs> formal education years and they had that drug soma right right <laughs> yeah, it, it was required reading for us in uh, the eleventh grade, I believe. Wow, where it was I a pretty read. graphic book. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, Aldous Huxley was kind of one of the bad guys and one of the good guys, both. You know, <laughs> Julian Huxley, all those people, definitely New World Order types. Yeah. But you know, I also found out that Aldous Huxley approached Timothy Leary and said that he shouldn't be promoting LSD so much because they were going to make it illegal. Well, I found out recently that it was really Ken Kesey who did that. Uh, 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 Leary wanted to keep it on the down low. And Kesey, of course, went in that magic bus all over the place called Further and and had the acid tests and everything. And that's what made them clamp down Kesey. And then when when finally they were prosecuting Kesey, he went back to Oregon and hit out. (laughs) <laughs> I'm an admirer of Kesey, don't get me wrong, but uh, yeah. but it's really interesting how the history, uh, uh, you find out what was really going on decades later. Yeah. Yeah. That, not to open up the psychedelic can of worms, but it's so interesting how that's so popular now. And um, I think the last, I mean, especially like 10 years, I've seen it just, blo- I, I mean, it was popular before, right? Woodstock and stuff, but the last 10 years just exploded and podcasts on it and just um, especially in the biohacking space, it's so heavily promoted. And what I've just noticed with microdosing is it really amplifies people's ego. That's been my personal observation. And it, it's just, it happens every time that's been what I've seen over and over again. So I don't know. Back in my LSD days, I probably took about 20 trips, and I'm glad to be alive after some of those because you uh, definitely get distorted uh, yep. senses of space. I think yep. it can be therapeutic, and there are times to use it for certain things. But I question also ayahuasca now because uh, if you read William Burroughs' experiences with ayahuasca, it's a lot different. So I'm wondering, Mm. is the ayahuasca they're using today Mm. the same thing that Burroughs was using? Because Burroughs, you were always eaten by a dragon on all your trips, regardless. And I don't hear that now from, I have a lot of friends that have been in the movement and things like that. And I don't hear those type of experiences. So I wonder if they really have had these different experiences. There was a guy that went down to, uh, what was his name? He was the guru of both uh, Andrew Weil and of Wade Davis, Schultze. Robert Schultze went down there and he probably tried every psychedelic that there was, but he was of a higher order. Uh, I would say the color chakra, which is mostly you get geometry. He saw no geometry, only colors, no matter what he took. And he probably took about 200 psychedelics of all different types, including ayahuasca and various versions of it, because all those tribes had different versions. The life of Schultz was so amazing that a friend of mine said there's only one person, and he's a pretty unusual person himself, that I would trade lifetimes with, Robert Schultz. Wow. Yeah, I was watching a, it was like a clip from Joe Rogan or something where someone was talking about the uh, the ayahuasca ceremony and how there's so many vampires. And this guy was describing 
that or i think it was uh uh, uh who's the guy that wrote the uh uh it's the white hair and he talks a lot about ancient civilizations graham hancock uh-huh. yeah he was saying that there is these va- energy vampires that go to these ayahuasca ceremonies to like get into people's heads during their trip and he consciously like forces himself into people's minds and like basically harvest their energy is that real <laughs> You know, I think there's a certain amount of voodoo has a reality because we overlap our consciousness. And I I don't know if I told you this story one time, but I I managed a metaphysical bookstore and I kept it open till midnight because my my the owner wanted to convert it to a dance studio. So I said, well, let me run the bookstore upstairs. So I kept it open till 12. One time I was working on a client, uh, keeping it open at the same time because Not many people came after 10 o'clock at night. And so I'm working on a friend named Wendy and uh, a guy walks in and he starts telling me that he was a physicist and his wife was a tarot reader. And he thought it was a bunch of nonsense. So one day he went downstairs and uh, in his basement and he looked at a mobile and he was able to control it in any direction he wanted with his mind. So then he realized that this is a real thing. So I was working on my friend Wendy. So I said, why don't we compare notes? Now, frankly, I was setting him up. I didn't think he was going to do anything. And I was going to show him some applied kinesiology and get a big ego boost out of it. Right. Well, I got surprised. We go in there and I said, well, why don't you go first? See, to kind of set him up because if he's psychic, he should know something. He goes over to her and kicks her uh, left foot and said, what's wrong with this foot? Yeah, that's what I'm here to see him for. And then he walks around in counterclockwise and said, how long have you been wearing that ring? Yeah, it's my ex-husband's wedding ring. It, uh, I've been wearing it for the last week. When did your problem start? Last week. Take that ring off. Your problem's gone. Then he continued walking around. He said, uh, how long have you been wearing that? Ne- what's, uh, what's wrong with your uh, shoulder? Yeah, that's my other reason I'm here to see him for. Uh, How long have you been wearing that bracelet? Take it off and you won't have any more problems. And what was I going to do after that? I couldn't follow that act up. Wow. So I had to admit, this guy definitely knew what he was talking about. So uh, a friend of mine studied with him later, and I lost track of him. I have also studied with (laughs) Seth Harabance, or Sean Harabance, who was the world's greatest... uh, psychic tested under laboratory conditions by both dr ryan and dr roll and i've seen this stuff happen so where does this stuff uh, have control of other people uh end and where does it stop wow wow that's pretty cool <laughs> i i uh, once told the donald lay that gurdjieff claimed he could kill a yak at three miles away with his mind and the Donald said, well, why doesn't he heal the act three miles away instead of kill him? <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a yak. I, th- I think it still lives down the street. Those are cool animals. <laughs> they <Love> are. <laughs> um, do you want to do the uh, questions that listeners sent yeah. in? They're kind of yeah. all over the place. So <laughs> let's do it. All over the place is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch. Um, this is a good one. Uh, and I'm curious your thoughts. Why focus on eating uh, produce foods if you're trying to minimize minerals and heavy metals since since produce foods have minerals in them, but you're trying to minimize them? They don't have a great amount. So I'm not against minerals. You need minerals, obviously, but (laughs) but why would I take excess minerals when I can just get them out of the foods? Yeah, I don't look for superfoods that have extra minerals and all of that. Uh, For instance, magnesium is very easy to get. Uh, We figured on what we eat, we get one and a half times what we need. And there's there's no problem with an overflow. But if you take too many, here's the danger. Think of your car has it takes uh, 20 gallons. What if you put 200 gallons in your car? You're going to have an overflow. Imagine doing that every day. You're going to have a mess. Now, I'm exaggerating that for the body, but you do have something like that. The body has to figure out how to get that off. If we like uh, if you have too much 
uh, iron, you'll only absorb like 10% of it mm-hmm. and you poop the rest out. But if you really need it, you can absorb up to 90 degrees. So to took me, me two years to learn that one <laughs> when I was against <laughs> iron, I think you remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you do need, in fact, I had, a, I, I know that iron can, uh, spread viruses and things like that mm. but i felt i was a little low on iron so i took a little molasses and mm. tomato juice which is a great way of uh, whether it builds iron or not it gets rid of anemia that's one thing i can say for sure wow do you think it's easier to overload on copper than zinc i think you can do on both and the trouble with uh with too much zinc actually can give you prostate cancer People who take that, I, I've had friends that I, I warned about it, and they got prostate cancer. Uh, copper and zinc are next to each other. It, one is number 29 and one is 30 in the periodic table. They're in the same row. They go into the cell, and they balance each other. They're like a tag team. Mm-hmm. And so you need both of them to balance each other. Mm. Yeah, so. I guess I had on Robert Selig. He's an like, uh, HTMA guy, really smart practitioner out of um chicago he had he had a cool esoteric video on the minerals and i think that's your cup of tea and he was like saying how zinc is the masculine and copper is the feminine and copper is venus energy i think and zinc is mars energy and he was getting really out there with the energetics of both of them which i think is, is pretty cool i would say that because uh basically your zinc is yang and your copper is yin. And here's a secret. In the periodic table, all of the odd ones are, are uh, uh, stabilized and all of the uneven ones are uh, what you would call uh, yin. They, they oh. have less energy. That's why where do you have your stable isotopes? On the even ones. There's very few stable isotopes on the even. That's why you can eat one, uh, say, one of uh, a toxic element. And if you take twice as much, it's toxic. And you take three times as much, it's not toxic anymore. Numerology, in a book by Von Franz, uh, following up on Carl Jung, claimed that numbers were archetypes and they were very real and that by changing the numbers to odds and even you could get different results in the body people think that's crazy but it's been researched to a fairly well and it actually exists donald lay told me the same things and i found that elsewhere and if you look at the periodic table look at all the stable ones now it's the odd stable fellows, stable, it's stable means- el- yeah, stable is yang, right? Just to clarify. Yeah, they, they, okay. and they have more, and they have more uh, uh, stability. While the other ones are more wild, they they don't last as long. So any of the even ones tend to stabilize it. It's in the same way we have the odd fellows lodge, but we don't have the odd females lodge. We have the even females lodge. There's no odd female lodge, and mm. if you look at the genetics. XY is a female, is is a male, and XX is a stable female. And if you want to see uh, a man and a woman fight over the TV remote control, who wants to change it all the time? Almost invariably, the the guy. The woman says, well, you just keep on one station. I've seen this over and over. There's always going to be an exception to the rule, of course. But actually, those numbers make a difference. And uh, you find zinc is more stable than copper, which is more unstable. And it's meant to be that way to switch off. Hmm. Now, when you get to the middle elements uh, where you switch over to like you're changing the furniture instead of the whole house, uh, then it switches back. And then when you get to the radioactive ones, it switches back again. So you're either measuring the outer level of electrons in the middle, the two levels and adding them up, and the three levels. And I've done the math on this. It, it took me uh, about a week to figure it out. But I, I thought, how come they didn't teach us that in chemistry class? <laughs> wow. What do you think about lithium? Because that's a fascinating one because it's used for uh, bipolar and I mean, they use lithium carbonate in like almost two gram dosages, but it's that's one that really affects our emotions. According to Donald Lay, lithium can cure and cause every disease in the world. So 
what you do is you keep it to a lower amount. Probably the biggest study was done in Texas on lithium, where they analyzed the lithium naturally in water, like the Rio Grande and other places, and they found in lithium-rich water, which wasn't much. It isn't these huge amounts of lithium they give people that cause moon faces and things like that. But they found uh, drops in suicide, drops in murder, drops in uh, drug abuse, drops in just about everything. So definitely small amounts of lithium in the, in the most ex- extensive study ever done proved that lithium is good in small amounts. Yeah. When we travel, Donald Lay would have a, a, a lithium carbonate, was it? Oh, I remember you said that. Yeah, that was fast. I forgot about that. You in said distilled that. water with a piece yeah. of ginseng, and we would yeah. take it for energy. And whether wow. it was psychological or not, I've got energy out of it. Wow. Yeah, I found a study. It was like 20 to 30 milligrams a day in Argentina, I think. It was somewhere in South America where between their food and water, because I think – Usually it's like one to ten, one to five, one to ten milligrams. But this was like twenty to thirty daily. That's probably the most around the world. But it's interesting that like electric cars, lithium ion batteries, right? The batteries that power my house right now. I mean, lithium, iron, phosphate. There's usually lithium in there. Lithium, cobalt, aluminum. You know, lithium's always in there with the chemistry. Uh, well, I think they're working on like uh, silica batteries now. I follow that closely because I use batteries to power my life. But <laughs> I think they are working on lithium-free batteries and they're making headway. But They will be cheaper because lithium yeah. <laughs> obviously involves all these poor people mm-hmm. in African countries digging in the dirt and dying. <laughs> and so does oil refinery too, right? I mean, it's all corrupt. It's like, no matter, there's no win with the current energy system, right? There's always going to be... Our Apple phones, I mean, slave labor is now ingrained, unfortunately, into our how we live our life. It is, unfortunately. <laughs> They're turning over labor in this country. The, the prisons now are working. They're even raising tilapia in uh, in the Colorado for Whole Foods and places like wow. that. Wow. So, but lithium, according to Adana Lay, it's more than just uh, – how you hold your body can retain minerals. Mm. So he said the Taoist thing of putting the tongue to the top of the palate, that's how you retain lithium, how you utilize it. You you convert, you convert make yourself into a lithium battery by doing that. When wow. you stick your tongue out, you activate titanium, he said. <laughs> wow. I just got a contraption because I always like like the as seen on TV or Kickstarter things. I forget. I probably ordered it early last year but it's like a thing you strap to you and it was super simple it was like ropes that almost looked like a backpack with two things hanging down with handles and you pull it and it like forces your <laughs> your shoulders back and it basically has like a little acupuncture thing on the hmm. the top back top of your back but it's uh you're supposed to hold it for three to five minutes and it kind of just yeah. like expands kind of a cool basically just using ropes i thought it was kind of a cool invention yeah, a lot of those gadgets actually can be helpful. That's great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Kind of a random one. Co- uh, collagen in coffee on an empty stomach. Is that okay? Uh, I wouldn't drink it, but I don't think it's anything really wrong with it. That's kind of happened. I, w- I would add some sh- some sweetener to it, some kind of uh, – uh, sucrose or other than glucose. The funny thing is, glucose is actually anabolic at first, then reverses as a resistance against it and becomes infectious. So when they give glucose to people in hospitals over a long period of time, they cause inflammatory diseases. But sucrose is not inflammatory. It's only starch, which is glucose plus glucose, well, big chains of glucose that can be a problem over a long period of time and actually cause heart attacks from the from the uh especially raw starch without butter and without sweetener gets into the uh, the arteries. Ray P talked about it, and I looked up at the research. It's very real. So, so I make sure my starch is cooked and add some kind of oil or butter with it. So I'm like at least half Italian, and I've seen the old black and white pictures of, uh, you know, in Italy, they're like hand-making pasta and stuff. Do you think you could live on pasta if you're using like olive oil and butter 
and you know meatballs and because i eat that like once a week probably <laughs> and the, and if the uh pasta is like they used to do it hang it on clotheslines to dry uh, because oh. it gets the vitamin d and the full mm -hmm. spectrum d back in new york the italians used to do it that way and they when they went to multi-story buildings, they put it on their balcony. Well, the powers that be said, you can't be messing, putting pasta hanging on the balconies. It looks really bad. Take it off. They started suffering from all kinds of diseases. So what did they do? They shipped in their pasta from Italy because they knew it was killing them. Something we don't even know about today. So, wow. yeah, pa pasta can be a really good food and energy food. And uh, mm -hmm. if you eat it with any kind of oil and maybe some kind of a sugar with it, too, and mm -hmm. make sure it's cooked well, it's a it's a really good food. Good for wow. bodybuilding, weightlifting, too. I feel amazing on pasta. I mean, if it's if I have a long drive afterwards, I feel a little tired. But I don't know if that's just the, the glucose spike from it. Yeah, you, you know, a uh, a car runs on carbohydrates when you think about it. So it doesn't need minerals to do that. The yeah. minerals we need for other things. The minerals are actually our anchor that keeps us mm -hmm. from getting cancer and to control the accelerator. But the life force is actually in the acids. A chef puts the top on a pot to keep the acids from escaping the minerals are heavy they sink to the bottom so you're going to get them and you'll get different colors in the food like in beets you'll get blue beets or red beets depending mm. if you use uh, if you put the lid on or not put the lid on or add a little vinegar or a little baking soda yeah we have to plant roots because we uh our, our garden beds uh molded with the high humidity so i'm trying to think of what are the hardiest things that even can live you know grow in almost no light it's probably carrots and beets, right? And turnips and yep. root veggies. You know, for because you uh, the as clay tends to retain water, uh, mm -hmm. it's probably good if you can get some peat and ash and other types of soil out there. Basically, uh, humic acid and those are actually forms of uh, of charcoal. Mm -hmm. if people don't realize they they help the plant growth and. The organic matter is supposed to be on top for the use. And then the mm -hmm. soil underneath can be clay silt, but clay will hold more water, definitely. Mm. Awesome. And if you yeah. have a lot of dampness, then uh, then it's better if you can get a silty or or other type of soil. Yeah. Yeah, we tried to create, was it a climate battery, I think it's called, or a ground to earth. There's all these different names for it. Essentially, we dug five feet down and we put a winding series of uh, corrugated pipe, basically to, to blow air through and either warm or cool the greenhouse. But they made, I think it was the tragic mistake of cutting slits in it. Mm. And there's so much water underground that it was seeping up that I think the water, I think is just going through those slits. <laughs> and now those tubes are always full of water. So in the spring, our plan is to just dig a ditch down to the bottom and try to route that water away. But uh, yeah, it's a, ch I mean, growing food down where you are versus in the North is, it's so different, you know? <laughs> it's really easy here. That's one thing, one of the main reasons we're selling California because of the yeah. farmer's market. We know most of the farmers and we know what they're up to, you know? We know yeah. the ones that are kind of cheating once in a while. We know the ones that aren't. And most of them are really good guys. Yeah. I mean, my first apartment, I had a, uh, from big lots. I don't know if those are still around. I had a topsy turvy. It was like 10 bucks and it was basically like on a stand and I filled it with soil and grew, uh, like cherry, uh, cherry tomatoes in it. And even on like barely any sunlight, I think it got like four hours a day. That thing took off on the apartment balcony and you could just put that anywhere down there and you'll have tomatoes, you know? Yep. <laughs> yeah. They're easy to grow. Definitely. <laughs> Um, what are Adam's thoughts on melatonin? I know you have, uh, differing thoughts and I, you know, I'm biased cause I have a, a financial interest in it, but I, <laughs> I pull on like Russell Ryder, you know, there's Doris Lowe. I think you guys have butted heads or you, I think you mentioned her, people have asked you about her, but I think Russell Ryder is the world's expert and he's, uh, he's been on like Chris beats cancer show and 
talking about how uh, uh, he's been taking 200 milligrams a day for like 30 years. And he's like, he's like Ray Pete. His skin, he, no lipofuscin, super sharp, super articulate. His memory's insane. And I think he's like 80 or something in his 80s. So, well, the one thing that Ray Pete did uh, recommend melatonin for was radiation plumes. And he oh. said to take an entire bottle. <laughs> so you could you could sell some for that because uh, <laughs> if we have radiation plumes from possible nuclear war with North Korea getting so rogue and with Russia and all this stuff happening in the Middle East, uh, Ray Pete said take a whole bottle of melatonin because then it will protect you from the radiation. Forget iodine, forget all of these. He said take melatonin. He said why he didn't like melatonin is because melatonin is made from serotonin to detoxify serotonin. And if you take melatonin, it doesn't have to make it from serotonin and you're overloaded on serotonin. Mm. So it all depends on how much serotonin you're getting mm. too. And, and if someone's low in serotonin, then it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, which is really rare, by the way. Unfortunately, <laughs> people eat a high serotonin uh, diets. But yeah, there mm. are people that are higher and people even take uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors and things like that they're now realizing that's a major cause of a lot of suicides and even a lot of the so-called school killings or 5-HTP right the precursor 5-hydroxytryptophan is a popular right. one yeah so melatonin ha has values and uh, and should be used I, I uh, actually worked in a health food store where the owner was best friends with the guy who first came up with melatonin. The, mm. the guy at uh, it was at University of Texas at Austin, actually, mm. where it was first discovered. Yeah, I was reading a book on the plane on it um, by Russell Ryder. It's the best book on melatonin. And it's just it's like a fourth grader could read it. It's just I, I love when people write books like that, not trying to sound smart, but he's trying to break it down with analogies and stuff. And. He was talking about the discovery of melatonin and how these two researchers were overwhelmed by the prospect of harvesting melatonin from like a million bovine pineal glands. And they were like, we can't do that. That's too much. So they synthesized it and they found that the effects were completely identical with the synthetic and natural. It was the same effect. Yeah, so many of the synthetic things work just as well because it is chemistry. Some of them are different because you have other things mixed in it, but I have no problem with synthetic melatonin whatsoever. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of people get on B vitamins because they're like coal tar derivatives, but you look at like niacin, niacinamide, B complex, I mean, even thiamine and riboflavin. I mean, people have used high dose of these B vitamins therapeutically for so many conditions. I mean, uh, what is it? Hoffer and schizophrenia with niacin, right? <laughs> you know, I'd use the chemical versions, the synthetic versions over the, when you see natural now, you're seeing natural GMO uh, funguses building the viruses. So actually, I would prefer the chemical reaction. Right. The old type. They, they definitely, some of the new ones now, they're making them cheaper and they find cheaper ways to make them. And if you don't have to, if you don't have to synthesize them and just make bacteria produce them, then yeah. you're going to make more money. So it's yeah. good to check in, look at the patents of vitamins and see yeah. who has the patents on it. Then you know. Same with vitamin D. Vitamin D was patented, but then they said it wasn't good enough when the patent ran out. And now they have different versions of vitamin D. There's not only D2 and D3. There's D4, D5, D6. I think yeah. there's about D10 or so yeah. if you look into it. An interesting one that I have is uh, calcifediol. And one of my guests told me about it. So basically it skips the conversion step. So it's not cholecalciferol, but you're taking the next form of it. So some people don't convert it properly. And that's where toxicity can come in. There's multiple routes for the toxicity obviously but that's one common route is that d3 people can't convert into the 25d so yeah. and people um, will yeah. survive they used to warn about fifty thousand international <laughs> units a day but my, the funny thing is my sister-in-law was on that for 
a decade when at yeah. one time Wikipedia said never do this over a month or three weeks. She was on it for decades and it never raised her vitamin D level at all. Wow. <laughs> so they kept wow. on giving her the 50,000. So wow. what she needed was just some sunlight and right. she lived in Arizona. So, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, there's, you made me think of a company, Herbatonin, and they, they market plant-based melatonin. And again, once again, it's that marketing of natural, not synthetic, but I took it, I felt weird, like almost anxiety from it. And, uh, you know, it, it's so interesting. All the, the different companies have their different way of marketing. And usually it's that natural angle. I've noticed that they take it's, it's whole food form, you know, it's this, it's that, it's <laughs> You know, another thing beside the hierarchical level I was talking about, cell, et cetera, things like that. Oh, that's cool. Got to look at your background there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really my, cool. That's my cat Man. lava. Coming <laughs> There's a kitty cat. <laughs> Doing a stretch. She's releasing trauma, right? <laughs> that's good they know how to purr and yawn and get rid of trauma too they're good yawners the uh besides the uh the different and hierarchic level the body geometry has a lot so if you stand with a like a martial arts uh, or tai chi type of bent knees it holds your calcium in your body if you go straight it tends to run out and also if you take all the calcium and vitamin d in the world and don't have an impact exercise, you lose it all. It doesn't work. Wow. All you have to do, like when Vibrin Gal broke her ankle in three places and they said she had to have all these pins and things and she refused and it healed anyway. Uh, we saw that once she got able to stand up and stomp a little bit, even by holding on to things, because she obviously she couldn't walk at that point, uh, the calcium started filling in her bones. Well, before, if you lie down in bed all the time, uh, they used to do that, and you, all the calcium would run out of your body while you were wow. lying down. So that's why it's not a good idea to take a naps in the afternoon on a totally for a long time on a like a couch it's good on a chair like astronaut to hold the calcium in your body while you nap wow and do you think walking is enough for an impact exercise for most people it, it helps walking helps the the uh what nasa did is they walked people with uh 50 pound sacks on their back and didn't work but when they stomped their feet and long ago before nasa came to that conclusion adano uh, Lay was an was an advisor to NASA, and he told them they could retain the calcium by slapping each other in the face. And indeed, you can plate it, but you want if you plated it this way, the calcium would go to one side. So you want to plate all around you, and you can actually hold calcium by slapping yourself. And it's the noise, just like the noise of the. The marching around Jericho caved in the walls and like soldiers are told to break step when they go across a bridge because the bridge will break down. The same thing happens with the, the sonics holding the calcium in your body. Wow. Um, this is an interesting one. So you make a lot of uh, social media posts and I think people... <laughs> I think someone said, why does he talk in riddles on Facebook? So hard to understand. I love your your stuff on there. But you had a post, I don't know if, you, if you'll recall, on Anato and vitamin E. And uh, I think someone commented, Barry Tan loves Anato E. Because he's, I mean, of course he loves it. He sells it, right? <laughs> but the, the tocotrienols. And you were saying excess Anato kills cancer. But then uh, can't be Tocotrienols don't do anything. That's the funny mm. thing about vitamin E. Almost every plant in the world has has vitamin E tocopherols, mm -hmm. all four of them. But the four tocotrienols are only done in rice and uh, palm and what, a couple of other things. They're not necessary for human life, so they don't do much. But I'm not against uh, a natto vitamin E because vitamin E is vitamin E. Mm -hmm. I'm against a natto because if you take too much uh, natto, even though it's a natural substance, it, it will kill cancer, but it keeps eating. And won't stop. Rubisi did it, and there's a, he he describes his experiments with it in his textbook in detail about how it started. It wouldn't stop eating. It ate wow. the body away as well. So that wow. didn't work out too well for the people he experimented on with that. Wow. Yeah, tocotrienol seems like a like a 
minimal that kind of thing. Whereas toco ferrols, like if you're going to take toco trinols, you probably don't, don't want to take only those in minimal amounts, small amounts of it, right? Because tocopherols are more common and yeah, all Our plants teams. need you can't a plant cannot live without tocopherols, and we can't mm-hmm. either. I mean, it, it's mm-hmm. definitely and probably the the gamma one is the most important. But they but we need them all. You know, mm-hmm. they different degrees. They often try to get a carotenoid or something down to you just need one alpha, but we need a lot of different forms of it that they just haven't found reasons to take it yet. Right. <laughs> um, I forget if I if we've talked about this before. What are your thoughts? on biofilms uh i think largely it's become a promotion deal but but you can you can actually get a film as a defense mechanism in your body overtaking certain foods it will form as a as a a defense mechanism so Hmm. there's something to do it but if if you're having three bowel movements a day Hmm. and they're well formed uh Hmm. then you're you're not going to have a biofilm, three or four bowel movements. Mm-hmm. However, uh, the, the, I have actually read in textbooks, and I had to read it for diarrhea. They have a new form of diarrhea. You have three bowel movements a day, and they're well formed, and that's diarrhea. They thought that three bowel movements would give you diarrhea, and I'm I, I had to read that three or four times. Am I hallucinating this, or am I actually <laughs> reading that? And a lot of medical books will say four bowel movements, even perfectly formed, are diarrhea. Well, I have six or seven bowel movements a day, and and they're were well formed. Uh, so it, once you eat solar, it increases your your bowel movements. Uh, when I first yeah. met Vibrant Gal, she was having one one every two days or so, and now mm-hmm. she's having uh, worked up to two a day sometimes. Yeah, and it's not just fiber, right? Because I think that's like the common mainstream natural health thing is, oh, just increase fiber and you'll have more bowel movements. That could actually make someone more constipated. It can help some people, right? But not other people. And I think you've talked about there's like emotional things to constipation, right? It's not just- Those are definitely big time. (laughs) Uh, When you take fiber, it's okay if it's in the food you're eating. Like a kiwi is 25% fiber, a prune is 25% fiber, other foods have it. But when you take a foreign fiber and combine it with another food, that's when you get into trouble. See, if they're out of time with the other food and they try to put together piecemeal something that nature has worked on for millions of years. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, what are you, Do you think it's okay to use like laxative teas, like senna leaf and stuff just to help somebody improve their when they're really having a problem yes but uh Mm. they do eventually cause addictions to them whether it's center or even cascara sagrada uh which ray pete was in favor of cascara but uh, i've seen the research that said uh, it's better if you don't but uh if you're not going to the bathroom then perhaps you should do something to help that along yeah interesting um what type of protein Should you pair with rice uh, and what protein to pair with root vegetables? Interesting. Rice is basically time neutral. So any kind of protein at the correct time. So you might have uh, uh, nuts or avocado with it for breakfast. You might have uh, beef with it or, or pinto beans with it for lunch. You might have fish with it for dinner or uh, what would be a, yeah, fish or something like that would be a good source of protein. Rice is actually a miracle food. They they used to say it was because it was at four fifths ratio and all kinds of things that I forget how that went now. But rice is uh, it's been used by the Chinese who lived in rice paddies, and when the ducks would land, they'd shoot that for a little protein. But otherwise, they lived on nothing but rice and a little duck program. Uh, protein for once in a while. Wow. And haven't people lived on just rice and bread before as well? Or... Yeah, you can, you can, well, let's see. Bread or is it bread protein. and water? Am I thinking of the priests? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that takes, uh, 
a, an ability. You actually have to work yourself through the oral processes to get to those processes. Because I think there are people who have been able to, like St. Teresa, give up food and eat one wafer and no water even. Wow. These, these things have been actually documented. They're very unusual, though. And when people try that on their own, they can get into trouble. I... Uh, I lost more than I gained for all the fasting I used to do back in the 70s when it was considered really fashionable to fast for 15 days and things like that. Yeah, somebody asked why. Let me see. Uh, it was something about fasting and why you're. Why is Adam against short term fasting? Doesn't it boost synchronicities and enlightenment? You know, I, I really don't think so, but in a way, it's good to challenge your body because some people can't fast. I was at Disneyland one time and I overheard two ladies. Can you imagine? I heard of someone they didn't eat for a single day. And I'm going, holy crap, by that time I was doing 15 days. But I did take oil and things to keep the uh, – mm. see, carbohydrates and oil are protein sparing. Instead of burning your – your. Uh, protein up you will burn the sugars and so you're pretty good with that kind of uh fast the dry fasting can be the worst and the water fasting it it depends if you're in a toxic city a, a city and you have all these toxins how do you know it's going out of your body it sometimes they move into the bone and into the cartilage and into mm. other places you don't want them. So when you fast, you need to know where are those toxins going? And it, as mm. long as you know that they're definitely going out and not in deeper, which often happens, then you're okay. So many it, people, if you're going to fast, you better know what you're doing is all I'm saying. Mm. Yeah. I interviewed a, a woman that created like the bean protocol and it's all about soluble fiber. And her big thing was that, uh, Hormo excess hormones are the root cause of every problem <laughs> in people's lives, like excess adrenaline, excess cortisol. I mean, she was super anti-coffee, anti-cold plunges, anti-enemas. It's really interesting. Pro-canola oil, interestingly enough. But um, she was saying the if you don't get enough fiber throughout the day, then the hormones, 90% of them recirculate into your system and they don't get passed into the stool. Is that accurate in your opinion? Or? Yeah, well, fiber is uh, beneficial. And when you eat whole food, you get fiber. There's mm -hmm. no avoiding it. And mm -hmm. Some have more fiber than others. So fiber is definitely necessary. When you get too much, though, it starts to slow things down and actually constipate people and cause more problems. Uh, resistance starts, it causes problems. And sometimes it acts like starch blockers because there's going to be protein in some of the breads and things like that. We sometimes uh, call it, uh, uh, we have various intelligence, uh, intolerances from it, but uh, actually all starches have protein in it, whether it's millet or it's rice or it's wheat or whatever it is, and we can get in trouble with that. Most people don't and can, uh, can eat it, but when you separate it and take additional ones, that's where people generally get in trouble. They take too much. Mm. Um, how would you heal from copper toxicity? Asked. You know, easily just stop taking it. <laughs> and, and then it, it, the body will take care of itself. It's just that if you keep on piling it in, it's obviously going to, uh, what are we going to do? It, it, when, it, when the boat starts leaking, you don't have to bail anymore. So, so, uh, by just well, well by someone just, has if someone's not having bowel movements or they have like a sludgy they call sludgy bile you know I don't know your thoughts on like Andreas Moritz I think he passed but the the amazing gall gallbladder <laughs> liver flush and like if someone's bile is backed up or not moving or sludgy is it going to heal on its own or. Yeah, it, it pretty much will. If you eat healthy foods, and particularly in solar, when you eat times of day, the tree foods in the morning, the vine foods in the middle of the day, and the root foods at night, we have been conditioned through millions and millions of sunrises and sunsets to the sun in the morning reaches the treetops, and they actually eat their breakfast in the morning. And if you look at the uh, respiratory tree, it's all all right there in in the brain and the and how the blood flow works and then 
it grows upward. Trees mm -hmm. head for the sky. Uh, in the midday, or your vines, they tend to go in a circle. And mm -hmm. at night, the roots tend to go downward into the ground. They, they head for the gravity is their center. Also, sometimes mm -hmm. for water, they will seek water. The roots will. And they'll go down as far as they can. In desert, you find roots that go down a lot longer in other places because they need water and they have to go way down like uh, uh, what are those trees? Some desert tree that's green in color. That does that all the time. So uh, basically, if you eat on time, you're it's going to be really hard to have diarrhea unless you're eating things like melted cheese. Cheese is okay, but melted cheese actually makes ketones in your body, which actually are like hardened. They, they use them in labs to harden plastic. Works the same thing in your body. Popcorn will actually uh, block you up. In Cottage Hospital, the doctor put death by popcorn. They made him take it off and put something else there. And he said it was popcorn. They killed him. Uh, yeah. The undigestible fibers can, can cause a lot of constipatory mm. problems. And also, there is the psychological thing, definitely. Mm -hmm. When people are constipated, uh, it's because they won't let go of things is a common cause of it they, they won't let go of a former relationship they won't let go of a former job they got fired from whatever it is uh mm. that's really common mm, interesting um so with bioflow some uh, uh got a question what are ways people are hindering or helping it is it the things you just mentioned is the melting cheese melted cheese and popcorn does that affect negatively affect the bioflow Negatively, definitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you have things that tie it up now, we didn't put it in our yes, no, maybe chronobiotic nutrition book. But my uh, when I told my co-author that story about Cottage Hospital, she had a story that capped them all. She had an uncle living in Winslow, Arizona, and his wife went someplace and he just sat around, watched football and ate popcorn and drank beer. Well, the beer built up pressure and the popcorn gave him a heart attack. So he was medevaced to a hospital. Uh, the wife visited him in there and they couldn't get him to go to the bathroom. So they actually had a drill that we were trying to drill the hard feces out that was stuck at the bottom of his butt. Wow. So she goes to eat outside at some place right she comes back and they have those police uh what do you call it you can't crime scene yellow things there and what had happened is they gave him a whole bunch of uh purgatives and they rolled him over and he erupted there was feces on the ceiling, on the walls and everything. They couldn't use the hospital room. They had to sanitize it, repaint it, take all the furniture out and put new furniture in, all because of her uncle. So that top, you know, my popcorn and beer, uh, any story that I ever could have. But she never got permission for him to use that story. He finally <laughs> died of a heart attack from eating like that. Yeah, popcorn is not a good food for you. And neither is psyllium. Psyllium, when I was a colonic therapist back then, do not use psyllium. I was taught by Dr. Merle Roy at the colonic school. And now I see you go to the, uh, you get a colonic and you, you're given psyllium, for God's sake. I've dealt yeah. with people who take psyllium and they have exploded when they've come. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> they've made quite a mess. They've been very problematical for me when I was a colon therapist. Wow. What about... Uh... Like I saw recently that they're selling a sorghum popcorn alternative from sorghum. Have you seen that or heard of it? You know, it depends on how digestible it is. If it's resistant mm -hmm. starch, it can cause problems, just mm -hmm. like starch blocker can. Mm -hmm. hey, remember when starch blocker was so popular, then they took it off the market because it made people's spleens twice as big. Now wow. they have new versions of that. I see something else they call some kind of starch now, and it, it's basically a starch blocker, and it, it swells people's spleen up, which is not healthy. Mm -hmm. That's why they took the original starch blocker off the market. It comes out of beans, and uh, they take the protein out of beans to do that. Not a good idea. <laughs> um, does seasonal affective disorder really exist? If so, how can one beat the chronic winter blues? It's melatonin. 
<laughs> yeah, the uh, now uh, melatonin. What it does though is get the extra serotonin that's building up at that point and absorb it. So it is good to have light. Ray Pete's strategy was red light. We use mm-hmm. red light, and also another one is you could get a spurty light and mm-hmm. and things like that. Ideally, you live in a warmer climate, but when you don't have that option, where you are, just go out and expose yourself to a little sun every day, and that's usually enough to at least deal with it. It's particularly bad in foggy areas like Portland, Oregon, Mm -hmm. and Seattle, where you're Mm -hmm. constantly – I nearly went crazy. When I lived in Seattle for a month, I was so glad to get out of there. I I left at at close to 90 miles an hour. I usually drive the exact speed limit, but I was so crazy to get back to the sunshine in Southern California. I drove like a madman. It was kind of like L.A. I saw like a like a tweaker wigging out at the gas station. I, I haven't seen that in a long time. Wow. <laughs> I guess people just lose it and then they use hard drugs to try to rebalance themselves. Probably. Yeah, a, a lot of that happens. Definitely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Red light or the spurty light. The one behind me is uh, UVA and UVB. So I've been using it. I think it's made in Italy. But it's just Philips bulbs. There's not. I think the the expensive part is just the housing. But the bulbs are cheap. It's just and they're UVA and UVB together. So two yeah. UVA and two UVB. You know, I had a little problem with uh, Philips, and, and you may not because we ran them all the time, and it the paint melted. Oh, wow. <laughs> the red paint melted on them. Wow. <laughs> so we, I hate to advertise GE, but they're they're on a lot of times. Especially we use them almost as a heating device since the rodents did our uh, heating tank we use them to kind of hang around and be yeah. near uh ray, ray pete recommended two or three of them during the winter and uh, he lived in a place in oregon where there was a lot of where people uh rust instead of tan you know wow yeah the lights we have here are led because just electricity usage they're they're lower electricity but they uh they're low flicker and they have three settings. So when you flip the light, it's either noon white or ah. like dimmer white, you know, a more warm white or amber, which is good for night. So I kind of like you those. are. It's good to have extra light like that. That's a smart <laughs> idea. Mm-hmm. Um, on the same topic, someone asked, when does when does real spring start? <laughs> 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 you know, uh, it's interesting that Sometimes you get your most powerful uh, UV rays at springtime and at autumn time, rather at the solstices. Uh, there was a lot of research done on that, on the Takata effect and some other effect where they noticed this time of effect. It's, again, it's not as simple as one or two. It can be one and three, one and five, and the two and the three, two and the four give you different results. So... I researched a lot of both phototherapy in the medical libraries and other libraries, and also uh, the circadian rhythms. And most of that has been distorted now because they don't want you to think it's astrology. Dr. Frank Brown was actually taking potatoes, plugs, 200 feet underground in the dark and put them in a vacuum cage and he could predict the weather a uh, day. Oh, we're back. Sorry, there's a little <laughs> cut out. <laughs> I don't know if that's my Starlink. I'll just talk about Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> right. We better be nice to him. <laughs> oh, your internet connection is unstable, is what it says to me. Oh, maybe it's your end. Could uh, be. Could be. I think we're back, though. Yeah, I, I, I see you clearly. If you see me, you, yeah. you just disappeared for about three seconds. Is all. Oh, okay. Um, how to heal? How to quickly heal skin, especially on the hands? Uh, expose your hands to sunlight is a good idea, and. Uh, get the right amount of cholesterol, which you can make through your liver. In other words, have a healthy liver and your hands are going to be fine too. Great. Um, Any dietary suggestions for preconception? Should coffee be avoided? 
No, coffee can actually be beneficial. Uh, there's there's problems with alcohol and things like that. So it's probably a good idea if you do drink alcohol and just have small amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to have my tequila with my meals until I read Dr. William Beaumont. And he found that any amount of alcohol interfered with digestion. So when I have my tequila and pineapple juice and aloe, I have it separate a couple of hours later after I have my meal. And uh, because he was he he had uh, if you don't know the story, this guy had a you probably know it. He got a big wound in his gut and he basically held him prisoner to uh, to examine every meal he took. And he actually tasted the, the meal out of his, the guy's stomach to do it back then. They did those kinds of things. He measured what the stomach was doing out of the stomach, how fast the acid did it, and what it did inside the stomach and compared it and has all these charts in his book, which says is still available on the Internet. And I found it really fascinating about how uh, damp weather can slow down digestion. If you take a nap right after you slow down digestion, you want dry weather. And if you go for a walk, especially in women, the wiggle muscle, the quadratus uh, lumborum, I believe it's called, you wiggle down and you actually make the stomach work like a mortar and pestle and 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 get the stomach acid every place. Another thing surprising is juice actually retards digestion. And if you but if I have solid soup, the water will quickly be absorbed out of the stomach and the solid matter can be taken. But if you have liquid, it is no way to get the acid to the to the stomach. So it actually weakens it. But Beaumont found in one case, if you had really weak digestion and you were recovering from a serious injury, then your only choice was a soup or a, a juice. But otherwise, it was counterproductive, which, you know, we're taught the other. Oh, yeah. juicing makes it more absorbable. Yeah. Not true when you think of the, how the stomach acid works. How is it going to get in on the yeah. individual particles if you've got liquid in there that won't come out? Mm -hmm. But the liquid, if you have it with solid matter, like in a soup with with uh, lamb in it or, or cucumber, I mean, uh, 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 squash or something, mm -hmm. it's going to, the water goes and then the stomach will work on it, but not with juice. So if someone has like a fruit cocktail with dinner, are there any ways to mitigate it? Like extra lime or lemon or taking apple cider vinegar, is there anything they could do to like counteract the negative effects or is it just one of those things like down at first before the meal, the whole thing? Well, if, <laughs> if it's solid fruit, there's no problem because then it okay. has something to work on. It's only when you take the juice and drink mm -hmm. with it. So when people, but drinking juice with a meal, that's no problem. The juice will just be absorbed oh. and, uh, and you'll waste some of it though with the meal, but it's not going to cause a problem with digestion. The stomach will just get rid of the excess water and work on the solid matter. Right. The problem is when you have no solid matter and just juice, that's when the stomach says, what the heck are you doing to me? <laughs> I mean, think of what tiger or, or for that matter, what cow eats liquid. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's solid. Yeah, it's funny. I, I hear uh, Dave Asprey released a reel. You know, I watch all these people and he was like uh, promoting orange juice. I don't know how old the lecture was, but he was saying how orange juice lowers lipopolysaccharide. I'm like, did he take that straight from Ray Pete? <laughs> he might have. You know, I, I owe Ray Pete my life because uh, I was eating uh, lots of tuna and mayo. I have, I still have about a hundred jars left over that I haven't given up that I was here just for a few years eating. I would eat uh, one half pint jar of mayonnaise would last me about four days. That's how much I ate plus all the tuna and stuff. Well, when I started, when I suddenly realized I had edema with swollen legs, this is eight years ago, no recurrent deals. I had, if I wiped my butt, it bled. If I, if I, touched my gums, they bled. I had purpura, these blood, blood spots showing up all over me and a whole bunch of other symptoms, including earwax and other things. And they all went away when I followed some things I cherry picked from Ray P. So I really owe him my life. I would probably have been gone by 2017 or so. And so you were doing orange juice with meals, then I take it, right? 
And no, I do that separate compared oh, okay. to Ray Pete. Yeah, I always I always kept that separate. Uh, Adonis Lay used to say, "Because uh, doesn't that counteract?" Well, you said juice retards digestion. Yeah, but, but if I'm you drink. Not, yeah. I'm taking it for a different reason. In this I case. see. So okay, that's why I, I would do that. But yeah. a lot of times we also eat solid oranges, but we do do the juice because it's simpler a lot of times. Right. Interesting. Huh. Um, what are some neutral foods that can be eaten any time of day? Rice, olive oil. Um, milk, right? Is that one? Not, not milk, but cream. Milk oh. is, uh, you know, and some cheeses, if you have a minimum amount for a little fat, no problem. But whole cream is just nothing but butter fat. So mm. if you have ghee or whole cream, there's no problem. It has no time limit at all. Uh, butter the same way for all intents and purposes. It has a little protein in, but no big deal. Um, rice. Uh, let's see. What else? That's all I'm thinking of right now, but I know there's a few other foods too that are neutral. Uh, let's see. I think we're getting near the end. It's almost dark out here. Uh, <laughs> it's, like it's still bright there. Uh, we'll end with a fun one here. What are his thoughts on extraterrestrials and recent UAP stuff, which is, I think is the new UFO term, right? It's an unidentified... Yeah aerial yeah. phenomenon yeah. they have to change it i think most of the new reports are cia uh programs but this is interesting and i'm not sure if he meant this as panspermia where these came as germs but when i first met a donald before any of this was known he claimed there were four races of beans carbon-based beans uh silicone-based beans uh, sulfur-based beans and methane-based beans. After that, I became fascinated because uh, they found that there is forms of life, sulfur-based in these volcanic vents and places and even on the surface of the earth, and there's methane-based ones too. And what really got me thinking is uh, I read someplace, or he said that... Uh, Sulfur, uh, let's see, they, they proved that sulfur needed iron to do its mm. metabolism. So I said, methane is not a single element. What element is tied in with that? And without hesitation, he said magnesium. And that's what it turned out. The methane-based beans under the sea, and there's, there's more mass of methane Based beans, and there are oxygen based beans on the surface if you weigh, weigh the entire mess. But he was right about magnesium. So wow. he said that the carbon based beans were basically the volunteers, and that the sulfur based beans and the silicone based beans, the silicone based beans were more likely to uh, channel you. And he said, Why would they need you if they're so great yeah. to channel? Think about that. The sulfur-based beans, he said, would experience, uh, would uh, experiment on us, and something about the methane-based beans. He said, do not trust most of the UFOs coming to the Earth right now. So I'm on the fence. I, I, I respect his view on that, but I see there's a lot of falsehoods. I, I've met, I, at one time, a friend of mine, Frank Haley, who later became a born-again Christian and gave it all up, but he was an expert on uh, on psychic phenomena and UFOs. I even did the artwork for his uh, radio station for his show uh, mm -hmm. with an alien. Uh, uh, and he uh, he I, I went to lectures of people who were experienced pilots who said, "You can't explain this." What I saw on the side of my plane flying along and doing zigzags and all that stuff. So I'm up in the fence and I'm, I'm really suspicious and I'm from Missouri. I just want to see more solid results. I doubt that Area 51 really has aliens. I, I doubt that at this point. But it's common sense that we can't be the only life on this planet. And eventually, even though wormholes have been proved not to exist, there's probably other ways to travel through the universe that we haven't discovered yet. We're basically primitive in compared to what civilizations might be elsewhere. So I'm, I'm open. Have you heard the idea that after 
Hiroshima, Nagasaki, there were uh, there was an explosion in sightings I after heard we that. detonated those. Yeah, I heard that too. <laughs> yeah. Now Carl Jung claimed uh, since flying saucers are round, when people are sick, they tend to form circles. So my my co-author didn't follow my advice, but I said, since people who need a healing want a circle, we should put a circle of the solar chart in front of our book, not this oh. layered thing. But yeah. that my advice didn't get followed. <laughs> but I found myself, when I've been going through stressful times, once as a teenager, I started drawing cartoon characters with round heads using a <laughs> nickel to, to do it. And, uh, and that when people, the, uh, what was his name? Uh, Adolf uh, Wolfley. He was an artist who could draw from one side and draw very geometric patterns. But when he would get stressed, he would start to draw circles. Wow. And when he wasn't, he would draw, do non-geometric uh, designs. Carl Jung wrote about Wolfley. He was a miracle. He he supported Switzerland for a while there because his wow. each art he did one a day was worth well over a million, several million dollars each wow. one. So he did them in newsprint. So they separated all those art because they were worth millions of dollars for each piece yeah. of the paper that they gave him a colored pencil to do this artwork with. You wow. can find his artwork on uh, Wikipedia, I mean, on uh, YouTube, and yeah. it's amazing stuff. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, the whole topic's fascinating. Um, uh, I like Earth Files on you. I think that she actually does a live every Wednesday, like tonight. But uh, um, she she wrote a book on cattle mutilations, and so it's interesting. You said the sulfur beings experiment on us, so maybe those would be like the Greys they talk about. I don't know, but supposedly a lot of the reports are like the Nordics, the tall whites, or like the quote good ones that are uh, want to help us. <laughs> Well, I will tell you something that does uh, point at extraterrestrials. <laughs> I went to Arizona with a couple of friends, and we ended up – what's above Santa Fe, the famous uh, – there's a famous town up there that everybody goes, all the hippies live in. Well, oh, Sedona? Or- no, uh, it's in <laughs> New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico. Okay. Yeah, but uh, any place, whatever that little town is up there, uh, okay. he lived out in the wilderness uh, near there. And he reported he was particularly interested in the cattle mutilizations, which are going on at that point, a- including the the so-called hum that was going on there, which he he figured was probably from the underground facilities in New Mexico that they really had. They have, they have tunnels below the earth, definitely. But he reported an interesting case. They decided to have sheriffs ring an area and put some cattle out there and, and then that where nobody could get in and out of there without them catching. The cattle got mutilated and there was no way they could get in. Wow. <laughs> So he wow. said, I don't know, how, how do you explain that? They had no explanation for it. Taos, Taos, New Mexico. Taos, okay. The Taos right. hum, it was called also, wow. that he investigated. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah, go ahead, sir. Oh, I was just going to say that he went to investigate the Taos hum driving all over New Mexico looking for it, and he figured it was coming from Los uh, Alamos, where they definitely do have these underground facilities that they've had for a long time since before the second world war. Wow. Yeah. It's, we watched a show like missing four one one. And there was a, I think it was a hunter that saw with his own eyes, like cattle being lifted up and then basically like lifted with anti-gravity across the forest, like a, like cows and just, or, or I think it was deer and elk. And then they just disappeared into the, into the sky. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of mysteries, like that guy in Florida who lifted those huge blocks of <laughs> no one saw him doing it because he yeah. wouldn't do it when they were around right. and get all these blocks and exactly evenly cut and lifted up where you would need. It would be hard for a construction company today to lift those blocks up. So there, there's a yeah. lot of mysteries on Earth that we don't know about. I mm-hmm. think one thing that's denied, though, is human creativity is often... We can't. We couldn't have been that smart back then. So it's got to be an alien that did it. Yeah. I think we have to look at both solutions. Mm-hmm. One thing, uh, Swami Nitty Gritty said, "How did the Egyptians move those huge blocks of wood? 
they put him i mean of, of uh, granite or of uh, limestone stone limestone mm-hmm. they had blankets like you pull a refrigerator mm-hmm. into a room <laughs> so they had other ways yeah. of doing it and now they found out that there were rivers going up to uh, mm-hmm. those pyramids too so there's other explanations uh, i'm right. open to either way and 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 i'm interested in it definitely <laughs> yeah well adam it's always uh it's always so fun chatting with you and uh this was a fun kind of kind of free for all chat. <laughs> so right. it, it's uh sunsinknutrition.com and then uh solartiming.com. And I noticed you have your your new ebooks, uh woke words in yeah. a whack world, new world, new word order dictionary, right? It's one of them. <laughs> I, I love dictionary. So I have a slang dictionary too, but this I thought I'd get those type of words that are being popularly used now. Yeah. And I've been expanding it. I'm on the third expansion now. And uh, the first person that bought one, I've been sending him updates of it so far. And now we're on our third edition that uh, should be available maybe tomorrow. Huh? Oh. Now. So anyway. yeah, That's great. And I didn't know you have a gallbladder book, too, with all the talk about um, bile. Because I have friends that are super into the bile flushes and stuff. And I just haven't, you know, I'm juggling spending three hours clearing my driveway of snow and stuff. I probably need to start listening to more audio books. Here's the problem with the gallbladder flush. Those aren't gallstones. Whatever they say, Mm. they're olive oil congealed through a chemistry reaction called margaric acid. But they still will move gallstones out of the way. I've I've recommended the flush to people, and they they escape gallbladder surgery because as long as they're not blocking someplace, they can sit in the middle of your gallbladder for years. And by the way, surgeons do not have to remove the gallbladder; they could just take the stones out and peel it back up. Oh. But they claim, oh no, uh, that will uh, they'll grow back. Well, if it took you're a fifty year old man, and it took. 50 years i wouldn't be worrying about it and, but also it's easier they can they can whip off right. one of those operations in five minutes and be done with it and throw the gallbladder away gallbladder surgeries increase dramatically just before christmas that should tell us something wow it's not the christmas food either they haven't got to that stage yet it's like well, it's like at the beginning of december wow yeah and you have a book uh also last year thyroid the butterfly the butterfly on your neck. I like that you're going through the different glands. You're going to do like the pancreas and the liver. and. The you know, at one time I was going to, I had wrote a book called Cosmo Chemistry that I started to divide up into elements. So I have a book mm-hmm. on magnesium, one on copper, one on iodine. I was going to do one for sulfur, iron and everything, but mm-hmm. it just, uh, we've had a computer crash uh, recently that blocks a lot of our work here that we're, we're going to have to fix that to get access to some of the old books. So I can't add additions to that without, mm. uh, anyway, let's just say uh, the, since Patrick Timponi went on his cog- cosmic vacation, we got hit with all kinds of power outages, four of them, water outages, uh, you name it. Even wow. if the alarms went off because the rats ate through it. And the alarm wouldn't shut off for three days. So finally, we got we had the fire department come out and say, "No, it's we can't turn it off. There's no yeah. fire." So they said, "Okay, let us know if anything wow. happens." And so we had to wait till the alarm guy got out here, out here four days later and listen to an alarm ringing for four days. Wow! <laughs> wow. Well, I noticed on your website you're actually uh, is this your first affiliate company, Frog Hollow Farm? Do they ship? citrus nationwide i think we i think we made a dollar on it so far or whatever but they they do do i'll that. order some yeah, okay. <laughs> <That's cool. Okay. laughs> i'm sure it beats our our uh our supermarket oranges up here because I, I know to source directly even if it's online you're gonna get better stuff probably yeah i i think so pretty much i uh, vibrant gal investigated them and they seem to be a pretty good company and authentic uh, so <laughs> Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I ordered mangoes from some website up here like two years ago, and they, they arrived all smashed in the box, but you probably just have to pack them right. So. <laughs> you might be able to grow them in a greenhouse up there, oranges. You heard about the guy that without a greenhouse grows them in Nebraska? 
That's pretty amazing. Yeah. He, he did yeah. something with the ground heat. I don't quite understand it, but he said there's ways to do it. I'm pretty sure it's the same system we have, the the pipes, but uh -huh. you just have to keep water out of them. <laughs> That's the trick. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I actually have a coffee plant in there. It's just mold. It's a little moldy and the droopy. So we'll see if it makes it till the summer, but I'd love to grow coffee up here. It'd be pretty fun. That would be so, cool. Definitely going to do tobacco. So. <laughs> You know, my friend who ran the only solar nutrition restaurant in the world down in Yalapa, Mexico, right out of Port, Puerto Vallarta, she had the only solar restaurant and she grew most of her own food, including tobacco, when she gave up tobacco finally and smoked it. But two hurricanes hit her and put her out of business. So now she's out of business this year. But before wow. that, she ran that thing for a de uh, over a decade, I think. And you had to hike up to the falls. And she got people, her reputation for that place was known in California. People would go there wow. to hike up, make sure you go up to Yalapa and hike up to the falls where she's got her restaurant, outdoor wow. restaurant. And she did her own cooking and uh, wow. growing foods and everything. She, workaholic. My friend Christina Ponzo now looks like she's washed out of business. <laughs> Well, time to get a, a, a dome, a geodesic dome put up, right? To have some protection. <laughs> Maybe so. She needs something because basically her whole her old restaurant washed downstream. Oh, wow. <laughs> two, two in a row. And look what happened in Acapulco. Holy cow. Yeah. Well, I hear, I think I hear a vibrant gal in the background with utensils. Is it food time? We better wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Are you using utensils? I just don't know if it's at dinner time over there. It's, uh, no, it, it might be something else, but it is oh. dinner time. It's probably time to go. I see it's getting dark where you are. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny with the shorter days. It's like eating dinner at the normal time. Then you go to bed an hour later. It's just yep. wild. <laughs> the good news about solar nutrition, it's not about phototherapy. It's about the time that the earth goes around in 24 mm. hours. And so then you get your different results. So it will work in the North Pole because people ask, well, there's no light up there. Yeah. But it actually affects your eating wherever you are. Wow. Ideally, temperate regions and tropical mm -hmm. regions work better, but you can you can pursue it uh, in northern countries too. And many people, friends of mine are in Canada and places like that where they eat that way. Eat so Wow. Well. Wow. Yeah, I've had to perfect the snacking uh so i i have like like i eat venison jerky throughout the day these little like jerky sticks and, and like just quick meals because you know it's just coffee and jerky if i'm out on the tractor or the or the snow plow for for hours you know <laughs> so. yeah that's where frank brown got in trouble he claimed that the the ambient environment was what set your cycles but the geneticists to pr protect their turf said no no it's been wired into the hardwired into the body. So the environment doesn't make that much of a difference. It's your own body uh, that makes the difference. So they okay. could sell their gene therapy. And oh. they basically, he Frank Brown was the father of chronobiology, but they, they dethroned him in 1960s at Cold Springs Laboratory in Long Island and yeah. brought another guy out because he was promoting the gene one that it doesn't make a difference what the environment is doing so much on your body. But hmm. the environment definitely has an effect on our body. Look at flowers, flower at certain times, certain plants bloom at certain times. Yeah. I mean, it's been known since the time of uh, the Swedish biologist Linnaeus, I believe it was, uh, that that there was timing going on. Yeah, yeah, because that question, when does real spring start? I mean, wouldn't the answer be to me when plants start springing up from the ground? Because you could see it with your own eyes. Does that make sense, or yeah, it, it uh, the seasons tend to regress. I forgot what direction that what what was spring uh, today was not spring before mm -hmm. because of the precession of the equinoxes and all of that, mm -hmm. which uh, 
Swami Nitty Gritty knew a lot about that, the 72,000-year cycles and all of that kind of things that you see in the Ayurveda and things. And they do make a difference. Uh, I'm not sure how much, and I don't know how to actually figure that into my calculation. He did. Somehow his body was tuned in to the exact seconds of when things worked and, wow. and used it in a way that was, was absolutely phenomenal. Anyone who was around him was convinced that uh, he had abilities other people didn't and knew, mm-hmm. knew things that other people didn't and what was going to happen actually in the future even. Wow. wow. Well, uh, for listeners, I recommend getting the Yes, No, Maybe uh, softback book because I think people aren't, I don't know, I think they like the hard, you know, something they could hold on the couch or outside or whatever instead of looking at a screen and they can always print out your ebooks, but I recommend like my favorite thing that you guys sell is the hard copy. Um, looks like it's thirty five dollars right now for domestic orders. The yes, no, maybe the original book, right? Marcella yep. von Harding, and um, I love that because it it has the charts right of the foods to eat at the different times, and it's kind of a good intro to your philosophy and what you've been talking about for a while. It was really good. Marcella was really interested in getting that thing uh, printed and actually spurred me on because I was dragging my feet on it. And mm. right now we're, we're actually running out of copies. So get your oh. copy soon. Uh, I think we're down to uh, just a little over a hundred books and that's it. Wow. Wow. And I don't know if Marcella plans to republish it or whatever, but wow. We'll see. I haven't been in Uh, touch with her for a couple of years now. (laughs) Wow. Well, you have the solar timing recipes ebook. And um, like I said, people could always print them out if they don't want to look at their iPad or laptop or whatever. That's Um, one way to do it. You can do that. Mm -hmm. And even a vibrant gal can send directions of how to make that into a, uh, uh, an audio book where you can oh. listen to it. Those are good to listen to. The ones I don't recommend, the Yellow Fantasies books, there's so much science that it gets boring to hear Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so <laughs> did this and then listen to all the scientific terms. But when the sun sneezes, the earth catches a cold and uh, sun sink nutrition uh, synchronized, they're good to listen to on audio. I think my favorite uh, part of your website is still the um, under the photos, Adam, then and now. And uh, the picture with Gypsy Boots is great. <laughs> he, he was uh, a common visitor to my health food store at that point. And I would buy his dates all the time and overload him because he was just such a nice guy. You know, yeah. He was a phenomenon, one of the most unusual people in the world. And he basically lived like he did he was like a monkey in the trees he was all at the hippie lovins at the monterey jazz festival he uh, he would go to lovins and swing through the trees <laughs> yeah and he lived in the hollywood hills just lived out there in nature uh, in, wow. in trees sometimes both in palm springs and in the hollywood hills that's yeah. incredible wow amazing human being just when he slept on a bed of nails uh, yeah, he was, he was a yogi. He was an astonishing guy. And how, I how did he, privileged. how did he pass? Do you remember? Or uh, it... I think he finally got into his nineties or something like that. And, wow. and my thing is because it usually takes some trauma. He was in love with an 18 year old who kind of used him to get her career oh. started. And then she dumped him and he took that really hard. Wow. I saw him deflate. Wow. Before I saw him at a health fair in the uh, 1990s up in San Jose, he was looking good then. He was looking dapper in a tuxedo and everything and running around, jumping up and down like usual. And uh, I thought he'd recovered. But then shortly after that, I already mm. passed. Wow. But his life mm. force, he, he would like when, when I was working for a guy in the health food store before I took over managing it. Uh, he came in one time, he jumped in the door, wrapped in Christmas lights, have a boots bar, have a boots bar. And uh, the owner looked at him like, who the heck is this? That's <laughs> Gypsy Boots. Who's Gypsy Boots? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, he I would, if I took a camera out, he would jump up on the counter and say, take a picture. He's got grapes and things <laughs> like that. And he would jump up and down and uh, 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 what a guy. He couldn't sit still. <laughs> Wow. 
Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. <laughs> well, awesome, Adam. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, go to Adam's site and check out all his books and all the photos. Even the periodic table one's really cool. And <laughs> you have a lot of cool stuff on the the solar timing site. So thanks, Matt. Yeah, and keep doing the cool things you're doing <laughs> and living the alternative lifestyle off the grid. Oh, thanks, Adam. We'll keep uh, writing awesome material and 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 really. Uh, yeah, questioning the status quo. I really appreciate it. So stick around as we close out the show. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> I love talking with Adam so much that time really flies. Three hours feels more like an hour. I found the information that he shared on alternative gardening really interesting. I'm definitely going to research the guy that he mentioned Gary Matsuoka I think to believe it I would have to see it in person people growing their produce in straight beach sand because it's so counter to what I've been taught and what most people have been taught about how you grow food with as Adam was saying compost and topsoil and all of the usual methods I'm also more excited to grow tomatoes this summer. I've interviewed Adam, I think, 15 times now, counting this show. And he's brought up the freeform amino acids in tomatoes multiple times. I think that's my favorite fruit. And I love that they're so easy to grow. So I'm definitely going to try growing many different varieties here in the Growing Spaces Geodesic Dome this summer. And definitely cherry tomatoes. Those are like candy to me. I find his perspective on minerals really interesting. And I did want to comment on the point that he made about zinc, that excess zinc can actually cause prostate cancer. But as the owner of MitoLife that sells zinc carnosine, that form of zinc supplement, I've looked into the research and he's right that excess zinc can increase the risk of prostate cancer, but the flip side, and you can't downplay this effect, that a zinc deficiency will equally cause or increase the risk of prostate cancer. And I'm going to cite one study here from MF Leitzman 2003. And it says supplemental zinc intake at doses of up to 100 milligrams per day was not associated with increased prostate cancer risk. I doubt you can do those doses with copper long term and have the same safety profile. So everybody has their own view of supplements. And Adam Bergstrom, that is a frequent flyer, a frequent guest on my podcast. I wouldn't call him anti-supplement, and he doesn't call himself that. He used to manage a supplement store, but he does not think that supplements are necessary at all, where I absolutely think supplements are necessary, and I've seen them uh, both change lives, save lives, and really reverse chronic degenerative states. I've seen this firsthand with friends a couple months ago, and one of my friends at the table was talking about his chronic ulcers, recurrent ulcers that come up. And I recommended zinc carnosine. He took it for just a few weeks to a month, just supplementing zinc carnosine. And in that very short period of time with the doses that I recommended, I didn't prescribe them because I'm not a doctor, but I just said, this is what I would do, as I always do when people ask me questions. And he saw rapid results. His ulcers completely vanished from a zinc supplement and food was not enough. The zinc in food was not enough, obviously, to reverse his chronic ulcer condition. I do appreciate people like Adam's food first or food only approach. I do see the value in that, but I just take it another step and say food and supplements, not supplements instead of food. How about both? And it really is a luxury 
to have the highest quality produce. The stuff we get at the health food store or even the co-op or even the farmer's market pales in comparison to what we can grow ourselves at home when we can control every variable, especially the water quality, like the hardness of the water. And I'm by no means a gardening expert, but I don't think I have to be an expert to know that the produce that I've been eating my whole life is not optimal. It's my opinion that food deserts are not just these small areas. We're living on a food desert planet. And unfortunately, with the amount of pollution that we're dealing with in the air, in the water, electromagnetics, there's so many factors working against not only human biology, but plants. So we're in a situation where it's actually a luxury to grow high quality produce. It's very expensive. I don't think water filters are an option anymore. They're absolutely necessary. So that's my two centavos on gardening for what it's worth. I'm going to learn through trial and error as I always do and share what works along the way. I'm currently using compost and topsoil. So I'll see how that goes. If you want to check out Adam's websites, there's solartiming.com. Definitely check out his eBooks. If you click on store, there will be a drop down menu and you can click on eBooks and tips or Adam's mini eBooks. I found the one on copper really interesting. It's called copper, the good, the bad, and the valid. And if you want to check out solar eating, you can go to sunsinknutrition.com. I'm a member. If you sign up, you can gain access to a list of foods, growth one, growth zone two, and growth zone three. Basically, the day is divided into three times from midnight to noon, from around noon to 7 p.m., and from around 7 p.m. to 1 a.m., and the foods that you can eat in those times. I've dabbled with it, and I was surprised how much I felt the difference. My website is matt-blackburn.com. You can read about my CLF protocol. It stands for calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis, and my solutions. A lot of them include proper supplementation. If you click on shop, you can see all of my recommended products, most of which have discount codes. If you live in a northern climate, I would recommend checking out the full spectrum light bulb. The one I have on the website is from Bond Charge. And what's cool is it has three different settings. So when you flick the light switch up and down, you can switch from soft white light amber light or a warm yellow light. I think it's easy to remember to put on some yellow lenses or orange or red lenses, blue blocking glasses at night, but often people forget the flip side to get really bright light in the morning and throughout the afternoon to increase their melatonin production and just set their circadian rhythm and their cortisol and melatonin cycle. I've really felt a difference, especially this winter, just keep reminding myself to expose my eyes to really bright light, high lux intensity in the morning and afternoon. I find it really improves my sleep. And what's nice with these, you don't have to switch them out every day at night. You can just flick it to the amber kind of orange setting. And it's really gentle on the eyes at night. My brand is called MitoLife. You can find that at mitolife.co. We're actually having several sales right now, namely Jellyfish Jolt, which is a really innovative product. It's wild caught collagen from jellyfish off the East Coast of the United States. And if you search the internet, you might be able to find some other brands of jellyfish collagen, but I challenge you to find one that has 
one gram of collagen packed into each capsule. We all want to take less pills. You know, you've seen videos and reels of big health influencers saying they take 60, 70, 80 pills a day. And maybe that's helpful in certain contexts. Maybe that's actually necessary in certain contexts. But most people I've talked to, less pills, the better. And if they could get the same dose that they would normally get in two capsules and one capsule, that alone makes a better product. And it actually implies that there's less filler in the product, sometimes filler that companies don't have to disclose. So I just wanted to speak to the uniqueness of that product. It was really expensive for me to invest in that and bring it to the MitoLife line, but we decided to lower it $10 recently for a surplus sale. So be sure that you jump on that while it lasts. That is an incredible deal. And of course, it stacks with discounts. If you've never ordered from MitoLife before, use the code first time and that'll knock off 15%. The supplement market is flooded with collagen products and a lot of them market multi-collagen protein. So they're mixing all different types of collagen, both from cows, from fish. What makes MitoLife so unique is it's not from bovine or fish, it's from jellyfish. And what's unique about jellyfish collagen is it contains types 1, 2, and 5. It's often called type 0 collagen because it's the most comprehensive collagen source that we can get. With traditional standard marine collagen, you have type 1, and maybe type 1 and type 3. With bovine collagen, you have type 1 and 3. With jellyfish, you're getting three different types of collagen that you don't get with those two sources. You're getting 1, 2, and 5, which is really powerful. Remember that amino acids are precursors to our neurotransmitters. So a lot of people are using this product for sleep improvement. It also affects the gut barrier, the immune system, the nervous system, but it has a concentrated source of the amino acids glycine, tryptophan, and glutamate, which are really powerful for helping to support various systems in the human body. Another sale that we're having is with digested all. And this is one that I don't talk about often, it's actually a 50% off sale, which is incredible. This is the best deal of digestive enzymes you'll find on the internet. So for $25, you can get essentially a three-month supply. It's a month supply if you do it right and take one with each of your three meals a day. Most people have digestive issues, and there's multiple reasons why. Low stomach acid from undereating protein from a chronic zinc deficiency. Maybe there's H. pylori going on. Maybe the pancreas isn't functioning properly. And one of the functions of the pancreas is to secrete digestive enzymes that help us break down our food. So protease breaks down protein into amino acids. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates into glucose. Lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids. Then we also have a bunch of other enzymes in there, like cellulase to break down cellulose, lactase to break down lactose. Personally, I use all of the digestive support that I possibly can, even if I'm not eating out, because I've had three decades of not knowing what I was doing the first 30 years of my life and just consuming a whole lot of garbage. So digestive enzymes, spore-based probiotics, zinc carnosine. I usually take apple cider vinegar with meals. I love the fermented noni juice from Shen Blossom. I do several of those shots every day. These are some of the things that I've been doing for the last several years that have massively improved my digestive health. And if you improve your digestive health, you're absorbing more the nutrients from your food, assimilating the better, your overall health will improve. So I think digestive enzymes are one of the more 
boring supplements. They're not exciting like jellyfish collagen, but they make a huge difference. I recommend getting a little Ziploc bag or whatever carrying container you want. Keep it with you in your purse or if you're a man in your jacket, bring it to lunch, dinner, whenever you go out to eat. And start to create a stack that you take with meals, a supplement stack. To me, Digest It All is really the cornerstone of a digestive optimization strategy. Some of the reviews for Digest It All on the website read very good for gastritis. Another person writes that they reintroduced eggs back into their diet for the vitamin A, choline, and cholesterol. And at first, eggs made them feel super nauseous. They could barely get them down, but when taking digested all, it significantly reduced their nausea. Another reviewer said that it, they used to have uncomfortable acid reflux, and now they have hardly any stomach bloat. And lastly, another reviewer said that it helps to keep them regular. So that's enough commercials for the show. I just love sharing this information because when I'm out and about, on the street, I'm talking to cashiers or people at the store, and they ask, what do you do for work? And I start telling them that I own the supplement company, and then we get into supplements. I'm always surprised at the knowledge about supplements that the general public has. I mean, they know about vitamin D and fish oil, and that's about where it ends. They've never heard of digestive enzymes, which is a tragedy because usually these conversations end up talking about digestive issues that these people are having. I think the average person can afford 83 cents a day, which is before discounts. I want to emphasize that the cost of digested all for a one month supply to have less bloating and discomfort and gas. For 83 cents a day, I think that's kind of a no-brainer, but people just don't know about it. They don't know that digestive enzymes exist, or maybe they do, and they're overspending on companies that spend a ton on marketing and ads. I don't spend one penny on ads. I put all of my time and energy into just blasting you with information, and specifically nuanced information, about all of these products that I provide. If you want to check out older MitoLife radio shows, go to my YouTube channel. If you just search Matt Blackburn on YouTube, it'll come up. I have an academy on there. It's MitoLife Academy. If you spend $15 a month, you gain access to two exclusive videos every month and a live Q&A the last day of every month when you can ask me anything. If this is your first time listening, be sure to subscribe to catch a new show every Friday. And I will see you guys next week. Stay supercharged.